Yep, that's a slide chart. Okay, good morning members. Uh, we have a quorum and I am calling now the, the, or this morning's meeting of the Health Committee to order and we are in live in public session. This morning, members, we are, we are hearing, uh, receiving a, minister, a ministerial briefing, and as always, time will be limited with the minister, and I'll allocate each member to an uh, uh, equal amount of time to put whichever questions they feel. Um, however, if at the end of if at the end of a particular question there's another question arising or outstanding that may cut into another member's time, I may ask the minister to to move on to the next member. But um, that's that's for each of you to, to manage in that sense yourself. I want to highlight there that for the budget briefing, the clerk has provided a memo at tab 6.1 outlining some. Um, so, so members, then um, we now can I welcome all those members who are participating by video conferencing today. And if, if I can remind members about the protocols regarding the use of electronic devices. Um, members, today, in terms of chairperson's business, the only things that I wish to flag are I did a very uh, a very interesting meeting with the Royal College of Surgeons, um, which I think will be of, of interest to committee members, and I believe the Royal College will be contacting the committee in due course to uh, to brief us on some of the issues that they see arising from COVID and moving forward as we seek to rebuild services and, and reinstate services out of COVID. Um, I also want to flag up for information to members that we are meeting next week um, in an informal session with the victims of the mother and survivors and families of the mother and baby homes inquiry, and that will take place at 1 p.m. on Tuesday. So going on then, members, to the draft minutes, can I refer you there to the draft minutes of the meeting of, ta of 4th of February, which is a tab 3.1. Are members content with those minutes? Alan? Chairman, uh, Chairman ahead, Alan. Uh, I wish to raise uh, a matter arising from those minutes, but I would beg your indulgence maybe to do it later in the meeting, given the fact that the minister is, is due to come on. I think the matter that I raise may take it more than a few minutes. Okay. Okay, yeah, we can return to that. Um, we can return to that. There is one matter arising then that I wish to raise, which is that members will recall that at last week's meeting, the committee agreed that it was content with SR 2021 forward slash 8, the Mental Health 1986 Order Amendment, uh, NA 2021, which was we, we agreed that subject to the outcome of the Chair's discussion with the Human Rights Commission. As you have noted from the clerk's email on this matter, uh, the Human Rights Commissioner has since indicated that he is broadly content with the provisions in the SR, although he did outline some issues in relation to this rule, specifically on what treatments are included within the scope of the regulation and if those patients with treatments that are more invasive would be prioritised. So are members content with the email which you all received and it was issued by the clerk on Monday? Members content with that approach? Yeah, members content, thank you. Um, so are members therefore content to write to the department to request details on what treatments are included within the scope of the regulations and seek assurance from the department that those patients with more invasive treatments will be prioritised? Are members content with that element? Yeah. And are members also content to write to the department to request that organisations such as the Human Rights Commission should be consulted with when drafting legislation that affect mental health patients? Are members content with that? Yeah. Thank you, members. Okay, members, we have now been joined, I see, by the Minister. Um, so I propose that we uh, we will we will now move to that item, which is COVID-19 disease response briefing from the Minister of Health. I refer members to tab 5 of your pack there. I would also highlight some responses from the Minister, which are tab 7 in your table papers. Uh, I can advise members that the Minister... And I believe he will be joined by the Chief Medical Officer, but but the Minister can confirm that when he comes online. Are both here today to update the committee on the pandemic. So we'd now like to welcome by video link Mr. Robin Swan, Minister of Health. Good morning, Minister. Good morning, Chair. Um, Minister, can I check? Is Dr. McBride with you this morning? I, I can't see him. He's, he'll be joining remotely. Chair, I can't see him on the screen. I don't know if your clerk can, but he... He has intended to be joining us this morning, so you probably catch you're, up. You're expecting but I propose, I propose we'll move, we'll move on in the hope that that uh, the chief medical officer will join us um, in due course. I'll give you you the opportunity to make your opening remarks, Minister, if you're content with that. 
Certainly, Chair, no problem. Uh, and look, uh, good morning. As ever, um, can I thank the committee for the opportunity to update you? Um, and, and Chair, I will keep my open remarks short to allow more time for, for question uh, and answers and engagement. And I think since my, my last briefing on the, the, the 14th of January to the committee, you know, I'm pleased to say that we are now seeing evidence that the measures introduced after Christmas um, have had a positive impact in reducing the number of COVID-19 cases and actually hospital admissions. Uh, and this has been reflected in the R number, which has fallen from, which was between 1.5 to 1.9 at the start of January to now below one for the past, past number of weeks. Uh, that has undoubtedly saved lives and interrupted a, a potentially a catastrophic crisis for both the health and social care service, as well as society as a whole. So I, again, Chair, uh, I'd like to thank um, you and the committee members for, for their support and the people of Northern Ireland for all their efforts and for the sacrifices um, that have been made for the sake of themselves, their families, uh, or health service and others. Um, although the downward trend in new cases continues, there is uh, an increase in concern um, that R ha has uh, stabilised and stagnated, and at times even started to, to creep up towards one in recent weeks. Uh, and that means that the hospital occupancy may fall more slowly uh, with pressures ongoing for, for a number of weeks ahead. So uh, just to bear that in mind, uh, that we need we, we always need a period of time when R is as low as possible uh, to more quickly break those chains of affection that are resulting in people becoming sick, becoming hospitalised and losing their lives to COVID-19. Our health and social care service needs time and space to deliver other care. Uh, and that has been delayed or, or disrupted by the epidemic. There's also the risk of increased transmissibility um, from new variants of the virus, um, which have been identified first in Kent and the accounts uh, for between 40 and 60 percent of the new cases here in Northern Ireland. Uh, the full impact of, of that new variant on other new variants will only be seen when measures um, are relaxed and, and the R number rises more quickly. Uh, than could have previously have been seen. Chair, um, I, I think I've always been clear that I, I, I share the desire for, for our economy and society to open up, but we, we don't want to see more cycles of relaxations and then lockdown again um, with all the harm that that brings. So we must take, as I said yesterday, the press briefing, I think we must take those small steps uh, and watch uh, the consequences of each step to avoid our exceeding one again which bring us back into another vicious cycle of, of epidemic growth. Um, Chair, Chair, as we all know, and I think the members of the committee acknowledged the last time we were in the chamber, uh, the vaccination programme is proceeding at pace and, and will save lives. Um, the number of vaccines administered in Northern Ireland is now well over 361,000, um, following the initiation of our, well, what is a twin track approach, uh, where both GP practices and regional vaccination centres are vaccinating members of the public uh, from those prioritised groups. Uh, the focus firmly remains on protecting those most at risk from the virus. And this current phase of the programme covers everyone aged uh, 65 and over and those who are clinically extremely vulnerable uh, to COVID-19. So based on the vaccine that should be available throughout February, we are confident we will see rapid progress um, through the first five priority groups. And Chair, I think it's absolutely critical that people receiving the vaccine, um, as well as their friends and family, continue to limit contacts as much as possible, uh, particularly in the period uh, directly after vaccination. Uh, and that applies to us all, because it, with it, uh, it is essential that contact is limited between people um, to allow the epidemic to slow, uh, to prevent illness and to prevent death and allow our health and social care service uh, to treat those already admitted and deliver all their normal services that have been affected um, by the epidemic of COVID infection. Uh, Chair, it is anticipated that we will start to see the full effects of the vaccination programme soon. Um, however, until then, we need to do all that we can to protect ourselves, protect wider society and protect our health service. Uh, and that's done, but where possible, staying at home to protect the health service and saving lives have always been clear. Um, there is still no room for complacency. Uh, Chair, following those comments, I'm happy to take the members' questions. 
Okay, thank you, Minister. And I see where we have been joined now by Chief Medical Officer, Dr. McBride, and you're very welcome this morning, um, Dr. McBride, as well. So I suppose, Minister, the first one, the first one from my point of view is in relation to um, the committee wrote, and, and, and I acknowledge everything you've said there, you know, and, and I, I do want to acknowledge, again, the very, very uh, difficult and hard work that all of your team has been doing, the frontline staff and the pressures that they have all been under, the huge cost that this has all had for members of our society and the huge toll it has taken. Um, and I suppose in relation to what you have set out over the past number of days around the concerns moving forward into the future and that, you know, and the, the, the committee certainly would share those concerns. We wrote to you, uh, the committee wrote to you on the 27th of July around the issue of independent siege and zero COVID. And they were putting forward an approach like a, a two islands plus an each island approach in terms of maximum suppression, sometimes referred to as zero COVID, sometimes max, maximum suppression. I have seen other um, um, debate emerging in Germany around no COVID where you take a maximum suppression and then a regional approach and, and things like that. The committee also brought forward the motion in November, which, which was passed unanimously in the assembly around significantly upscaling the whole fine test, trace, isolate and support element, which, which I and I think many others believe will be an essential uh, alongside of the very, very welcome vaccination program. But I don't think the vaccinations at this point in time or in the near future are going to be the entire solution. So can you tell us what uh, there, what changes there have been in terms of the strategy moving forward, given that we have experienced now potentially three waves of this. The first wave obviously was unprecedented. There was massive uh, learning to be achieved. There was massive um, things to be put in place around PPE. But as time goes on, I, I suppose we, we, we are keen to see what learning has been garnered from that and what is what is being done differently now to prevent, as you say yourself, and, and I agree with you, that we don't wish to see more cycles of this or more cycles of lockdown. So what can you tell us in relation to the strategy? Well, well, Chair, I suppose um, we are, um, we're actually preparing a paper at the moment, as you'll be aware, you know, the executive has put together an executive uh, COVID task force. Uh, part of that uh, is actually one of the four pillars, and it is part of the health response, uh, which in includes just called as well as called the protection uh, section of it. That includes vaccination, and, uh, test, trace, and protect, uh, and also the regulations that we take responsibility for because of the, the driving nature that we have. So I suppose the main steps forward in regards to the differential in the strategy of how we cope at this point in time compared to where we were um, in the initial uh, phase, Chair, and I think it's that, that's what you referred to in the learnings. Is very much in regards to where we are now with test, chase, and protect. You know, a massively scaled up system that makes those contacts um, actually in a rapid speed of time. And I think it's actually I signed off on a, a, a written question to, to Paula Bradshaw, I think it was yesterday or the day before, in regards to our average time for making a contact through TTP is something like six and a half hours from initial point of view. So, you know, our initial recommendation to the system. So, a system that has been, been massively scaled up. And still achieving very high um, success rates, Chair. You know, back in January, you know, when we were seeing that real first um, peak, um, peak of this wave, you know, the, the worst that we saw, uh, we transferred uh, that week something in the region of 12,000 cases, positive cases, to our TTP system. Um, and we received, we, we were able to contact 93.5% of those. Uh, you know, so that's a massive operation for that numbers. Now, within the last week's report, that's down to 3,000 cases, but because of the restrictions of the, you know, and where we are at this minute in time, you know, that was expected. There's fewer positive cases coming through, but we're still sitting at that 94% contact level as well. What would be concerning, Chair, and it's just maybe as an aside coming out of this, we're actually seeing an increase in the number of contacts that each positive case has, even though we're in a lockdown situation, so it has moved. It has moved from just below one at the start of the year to nearly two and a half now for every positive contact. So, um, slightly concerned that the positive cases are still still seeing more 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 people, even though we're in that period of restriction. So, TTP, you know, since initial wave to where we are now has moved on massively in regards to the scale up of the system. I quickly interact the advice and guidance um, that they give, even through the electronic 
uh, methods that we're using there as well. Uh, one of the big changes we've also seen then as well, and it's, um, it's, it's some of the recommendations that we're actually bringing now to, to the executive, and it's, uh, they'll be tabled in the paper to them uh, tomorrow, Chair, is just how we look at the, the wider interventions of testing, you know, the use of lump testing and workplace settings and hospital settings, special school settings. So it really is, you know, and it goes back to, I, I think you, you know, it's about finding uh, as part of the strategy, you know, that you referred to, that has been referred to there as well. So actually targeting that not in a more, um, a more intelligent way where we go into those areas of high risk uh, that we've seen in the past where outbreaks can occur. We've already, you know, as older, we've already similar practices up and running uh, within a number of meat factories. That's about to be rolled out at the Transland as well. So there has been large step and large scale uh, moves in regards to that. Uh, again, one of the other, and it's, um, it, it's one that has, has been, I suppose, pro progressed in the background as well, Chair, and that is the testing of wastewater uh, for the identifi identification of COVID in particular uh, geographical locations. So that's been done uh, actually in collaboration between um, three universities, uh, Queen's, uh, Angus Trinity and Dublin as well. So it's all about the advances that we've seen in science and actually test and protect. In regards to, uh, and you you specifically mentioned you know, that two islands approach. It's something, Chair, especially as we see now um, with the, I suppose, the more the identification and the easier identification of new variants um, actually across the world. That, uh, you know, and I, I'm on record saying this, you know, but it, it has to be a bit of two islands approach as to how we, how we manage uh, international travel. Um, I am assured that that, that that piece of work um, is progressing. Um, between between the executive office, uh, there was a task force established um, led by TEO that was established a couple of weeks ago. Was engaging with um, both Westminster and on Dublin in regards to how we pull pull that international piece together. You know, I've just heard in the new, news headlines this morning about steps that the Irish government are taking about uh, travellers coming in from from other other international countries as well. Uh, one of the the things that that we have at this moment in time chairs the fact that we still do not have um, international flights coming into Northern Ireland. Um, and I think it's something that the First Minister and Deputy First Minister have, have raised it so that anybody can then on an international flight actually quarantines um, at the point of arrival. Um, so whether that whether that's at, at a London airport, Dublin airport or, or or wherever, so that's, that that work is still still being bottomed out at right, right, that level, chair. So that's that, that, that's the changes I suppose and the advances that, that have been made from from ourselves. Um, as we are sorry, I suppose we can look at the other one as is just the medical treatments as well. You know, we're we're increasingly looking at or increasingly hearing of different um, medications, medications that are already on the market uh, that are having positive um, effects and. and um, I suppose rehabilitation effects for people who are suffering from from the effects of COVID as well. So you know all those changes have been have been developing over that space of time, and just how we treat COVID patients, uh, because there's been a lot of learning done here from the first wave. Okay, and and would, with all of that being being said, then would you be confident that that the now would be able to prevent? The type of swords we have seen, given uh, given uh, new uh, variants. Chair, um, I, I wouldn't want to say we, we could prevent another surge because that's out with my hands. That's within the hands of the the, the people of Northern Ireland, of the executive, uh, how we react over these next um, three four weeks, um, next two three months in regards to where we we currently are. As I said in my opening statements, you know we've seen our below one now for a couple of weeks. But what I always caution, and I do have to caution, is that started from a very high level. You know, if you remember sort of back towards the, the end of last year, the start of last, this year, you know, we'd have just approaching a thousand people in hospital with, with COVID. Um, as of yesterday, that number was still, I, I think it was 500, 554. At the peak of our first wave, it was 322 chairs. So although we are seeing, you know, and I welcome, uh, and I strongly welcome the decrease that we're seeing in number of people in hospital, number of people in ICU. It's still in excess 
of where we were in the first wave of that first peak. So we're going in the right direction, but we've a long way to go. So it's about taking, um, taking as I said yesterday, and I think the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister has used the language in the past as well, but taking those, those small those small steps. Okay. Thank you. Um, Minister, then I've gone on to just the issue of the vaccines, and, and I want to first of all acknowledge, and you've, you've reported there this morning, that 361,000, I think, at this stage, or plus of that um, there has been significant and, and fantastic work done in that respect. However, I'm sure you're aware, as, as all reps on this on this call, and, and everyone will be aware that there are also significant concerns, co areas of confusion around how the rollout's working and how people are booking their vaccinations and things like that. And just some of the examples are um, a 72-year-old a man in the Northwest who has been, has been significant underlying conditions, has secluded himself for since the very start of this um, and would would uh, would want to get the Pfizer vaccine, has done his own research, would want to get the Pfizer vaccine, uh, but has been offered the AstraZeneca. There's other cases where people who are clinically vulnerable are really, really confused. And I have a lot of these inquiries at the present time about when they're going to be and when they're going to be. And they're, they're hearing of issues such as what has happened in the Belfast Trust, they're here enough community voluntary, and they're wondering when it is that they can expect to get uh, vaccinated. I have one particular woman who's caring for a young a Down syndrome man who had been very active, very independent, and also caring for her husband. They too have literally secluded themselves in their own home since the very start of COVID-19 without any break or respite and are desperate. Uh, are there issues there that, that can be addressed in terms of speed of, of vaccinating those vulnerable sectors and also communicating how the system is working out to, to people to avoid confusion or to, to provide clarity to them? Uh, Chair, look, as, as I said, you know, we are now, you know, we're down into where we're vaccinating that 65 plus age groups through across GPs um, and trust they're kind of extremely vulnerable are our next cohort. Um, to, to be to be coming forward, where the there, there was a, a conversation last night between uh, Patricia Donnelly trusts and GPs as to how we we actually manage those. Chair, for for those who have identified as kind of extremely vulnerable, Northern Ireland has a very high percentage um, of people in Northern Ireland who, who fall into that category. We have started um, actually through some of the trust centres to bring forward those who are deemed extremely uh, clinically vulnerable. Uh, there's over 4,000 of those have been done um, through the trust centre. So while we work through, and, and it is, again, it's taken you know, the JCVI guidance and risk, and that risk assessment we're working down through, and we are now at that 65 to 69-year-old cohort who so are clinically extremely vulnerable, are the next group that we will be moving into. So we'll be, with that communication will be coming out um, soon. Uh, we are moving um, at the speed that our vaccine um, deliveries allow us to, Chair. Um, you know, if, if we had more vaccine, we would move faster. Um, so that's, that's that there's always been the limiting factor. And I think of, even if anybody looks, you know, if you compare where we are across any of the, the other three nations across the UK, everybody's about the same level. Uh, and that's because we are... Well, I've lost, uh, lost uh, coverage there slightly for this. Can you hear me there, Minister? I can't call him, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I lost you there just towards Sorry. the end of that. Minister, I'm not sure what happened with my screen. Could you just repeat the last bit of that, please? Was it the good bit you must die? Yeah, it always is. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, sorry, Colin, I've lost. I've lost, yeah, you know, you're back again. No, yeah, sorry, what, I, sorry, what I was saying, Colin, you know, we'll, we'll be moving now into that clinically extremely vulnerable group. So we identified those who are extremely Clinically vulnerable, they have been identified through trusts and surgeons. There's over 4,000 of those have been done through our, our trust site, and more will be called forward. So once we get that 65-year-old cohort and through yet, uh, Patricia may have left GPs and trust last night, that is our next step. So we will be communicating with people. But it's our limited speed, uh, as you asked about, is um, we can do to speed that up. Unfortunately, we move at the speed of the vaccines uh, that we have. And as I said, if you look at the delivery across any of the four nations, everybody's about the same level because we're all working to the maximum of the, of, of the vaccine supply, uh, the vaccine supplies that we have. 
Um, so that's where we're, we are there. So look, there are some very, and I think you, you highlight them, Chair, there are some very, um, some very, you know, personal cases um, of, of people and look when we will get the vaccine to to, to those groups as soon as, as soon as we can and we're working through those cohorts as quickly as and efficiently and as safely as we can as well. Okay, thank you, uh, Minister. And the final one from me then for go to members is around um, the the uh, surgeries and the cancelled surgeries and the very, very dire situation that we were in starting before this pandemic, but also the fact that we are now, I, I understand in terms of England, Scotland, Wales, and here, we also are worse in terms of the metric of how many have been cancelled proportionally. Um, I'm very concerned about that. I'm very concerned about paediatric surgeries, I have to say as well, because obviously many of these conditions can have serious health impacts, first of all, but also serious psychological impacts for young people, maybe maybe more so than than, than older people. So um, it's an area of huge concern. We, we really have reached the position where I suppose we would want within health to be in a case where we are dealing with COVID to the extent that we are not allowing it to impact on the very, very important work that we have to do around surgeries and also the whole issue of inequalities and how that impacts people who are already struggling with other multiple inequalities. So I'm just wondering what you can tell us in relation to the plans to reinforce, rebuild and catch up on those very important surgical surgical operations. No, no, Chair, and, and I think you know the, the point you had. You know, if you you met the the Royal College, um, I think I heard you say in your open, opening comments. You know, a, a group that has worked um, extensively with us in regards to their approach, even of the formation of those regional um, waiting lists, uh, and being able to prioritise that as well. But I'm sure if you engage with those with the Royal College Chair, they've told you as well about the challenge that that brings about you know, having to prioritise people on a regional basis rather than they're just their, their own local lists as well. So the step forward that you know, our surgeons have taken in regards to that being willing to travel uh, to utilise theatre space wherever wherever that may be. And that's what we're looking now, you know, the, the establishment of that that regional response. You know, we're looking at regional lists um, being set up in the Royal and the Ulster and, you know, even in the SWA um, uh, and, and the Southern Trust as well. So it's about taking uh, both surgeon and patient to where the facilities are present. So, you know, that's something we were never able um, to do before or never done before, Chair, because we didn't, we didn't look at that, that as approach. There's also the utilisation of the independent sector that we're looking at, looking at as well with another, I think it's 112 uh, uh, available slots that they have offered us and it's working about them in the long term. Um, and I think you highlighted, Chair, from the beginning, we started off from a very bad place, um, and that bad place, you know, and I, I've said it, and uh, I, I think other parties are, are acknowledging that we started off from that bad place due to an underinvestment in our health service over the past number of years, and we're now paying the, we're now unfortunately paying the cost because of the skill sets um, that we need from our theatre nurses to our anaesthetists are, are those, those skill sets that we also need uh, to support our ICU and our advanced uh, um, increased ICU capacity as well. So it's about, um, it's about matching that. And, you know, there's sort of some of the surgeons I'm talking to, you know, they're coming up with, with very creative responses uh, as to how we do this and the, the utilisation of the lag and valley for that day procedures unit uh, of what they see. And, you know, I, I think is really progressing. And I think, you know, coming out of COVID will be one of the benefits that we've seen if we can replicate that, that elsewhere as well. So it's about utilising every spare every spare capacity that we have, Chair. But, but Chair, there's, there's one thing, um, and while, um, like you, and I think like everybody else, I'm keen to get back up uh, and running once we get through this, this pandemic as quickly as possible, one thing I will say, um, our staff will need um, respite in the break. You know, to move from from the intense pressures that we're seeing to COVID straight into high pressure work to, to challenge waiting lists. I, I do think from for their psychological well being, for their physical well being, we will have to look at bit how, how we factor in that bit of respite between moving and, and shifting those two gears as well. So that work is that work is, is being looked at and has been undone because we do have to get back and, and 
top of our normal day procedures as soon as we can. But Chair, it goes back to that point. We can treat more non-COVID patients um, when we have less COVID patients. So it's about driving down the infection rates. It's about driving down the, the number of patients um, that we actually have in hospitals due to COVID. So we can free up and utilise more of that capacity and more of that, that skill set as well. Okay, um, thank you. Thank you for that. So I'm going to go across to members and I'm going to go first to our Deputy Chair, Pam Cameron. I then have Paula, Jerry, Carol, Jonathan, and Arlea at this point in time have indicated. Um, so go ahead, Pam, please. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Minister and uh, Chief Medical Officer, for your time at the committee. Um, I have a few questions for you. Um, I want to kick off first with the with the vaccine and ask you um, how many people are expected to have received um, a first dose um, of the vaccine by the end of April. And when it comes to vaccinating the generally healthy population, will GPs and the seven centres have enough capacity to maximise this delivery? And my third point just on that question would be around whether you are considering having a, a, an appropriate standby list uh, in particular for people who are clinically extremely vulnerable or just simply vulnerable um, in order to ensure that um, there's we don't have wastage, number one, but also that um, those who really need the, the vaccine before you know the, the healthier population receive that as quickly as possible. I'm thinking of the end of the, each day uh, to avoid wastage, just to ensure that I think you could have a list ready and available there uh, of people who have can agree that you know at short notice they can travel to a vaccine centre to to get their vaccine. So that's my first question. Thanks. Okay, chair. Um, in regards to to end of April, I I just wouldn't have an exact exact figure because our, our stocks just don't allow us to go. To our our pre plan deliveries don't let us go to that point. That we look more in the cohorts as to where we hope to be. Um, so by the end of April, we would hope to be they would be well into the. The, the sixth cohort as well. Uh, I've been delivering max, uh, the, maximum, uh, the maximum output for our vaccine centres. Um, the two, the twin track approach we're taking through the regional centres and through the GPs is actually working well because it matches the delivery of vaccines that we're currently, currently um, receiving. Now we can scale up. We're looking at other, um, other locations for other regional vaccine centres as well. Should there be, be more vaccine become available. But one of the things that I, I would caution, and I, I suppose want to put down marker now, that you know, very, very shortly we, we, we will be moving into um, second vaccine dosage. Um, so we need to be looking to make sure that we have the vaccine to supply the second dose, plus continue to bring on new uh, clients to get vaccinated, new patients to get vaccinated as well. So there will be a logistical challenge where we're actually running um, really, two vaccine programs, which is one's delivering the second dose, one that's still delivering um, new doses as well. That will be dictated by supply. Um, you know, we have the abilities and, and places to do that. So it's running those two systems uh, in parallel. Um, and in regards to wastage, because of the booking systems that we're actually using, um, so we know through the regional centres with a good idea of, of who's coming. Uh, we have very few. Um, no shows, to be quite honest with you, because there's actually queues to get this rather than, than, than people losing slots. Um, if it comes to a point where the vaccine has been drawn up, diluted, and it does look as if there, there may be wastage, we actually have healthcare workers uh, on standby who receive their second dose as well. So rather than waste due to something being timed out, uh, rather than, you know, particular trigger packages or droppages, uh, we actually do use um, those to pick up second doses as well. So it's, it's, there is that less system on standby, but it's, it's more for, for healthcare work. It's not large numbers, Pam, um, I would say, because we do get everybody who is booked in, the uh, majority of them coming forward. Okay, thank you for that, Minister. Um, I wanted to move on to um, child protection issues. Um, weekly child protection referrals have dropped by 37.5% since 22nd of December. Have we reached the point where the risk of not being able to prevent harm for vulnerable children now outweigh the wider health benefits of closing schools? Um, that's, uh, 
that's a challenging question, Pam, because it's a, it's not a it's not a way I um, it's not a way that I've previously they, they thought about it because you know looking at the numbers of referrals, there there is a direct correlation uh, that could be taken by the closure of schools uh, and those numbers not being reported, and I think that's something that the the chief social worker has been uh, has referred to in the past, but it, it also then counterbalances actually with the number of children that we actually have in care, which has increased um, over the same period uh, as well. So um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a balance there. Um, and it is, um, I think it's something that I would need to take a further look at and further guidance on because there could be a, a direct correlation there and that balance does need, need to be assessed. Um, Michael, do you want to come in maybe from a, a medical point of view? Yes, I mean, I think it's a very important point, um, Pam, just in relation to referrals, and you're absolutely correct, uh, referrals uh, have fallen uh, by some 11, just over some 11%. Uh, they have picked up again in uh, November, uh, and uh, the Minister did issue a press release uh, just to indicate that uh, child protection services, uh, family support hubs, uh, encouraging those parents who have concerns, etc., that the services are available and are accessible. In terms of um, um, the impact on children, I think we all recognise that this pandemic uh, has had a very significant impact on children, children's education, on children's uh, health, uh, and children's mental health and well-being, uh, and, and uh, the emotional impact uh, of that. Uh, and at all stages, the executive has faced very difficult choices in terms of uh, the risks associated with more interactions um, versus the benefits of restricting some of those social interactions, including the mixing that goes on within schools um, and the potential to drive the pandemic. Uh, as uh, our experience of this virus has grown and as the evidence has accumulated, uh, we know now uh, that uh, schools uh, and mixing in schools does uh, drive infections in the community and particularly in contacts with families um, and particularly in the context of the new variant uh, which the minister uh, mentioned earlier uh, the, the sort of reopening of schools um, will certainly add significant upward pressure to our there's no doubt about that um, that could be up as high as uh, you know, 10 it could be between 10 and 50 percent and it just depends to what extent schools are opened when schools are opened um, and the degree of mitigations that are in place. Clearly, uh, as Minister has said in responses earlier, uh, the longer uh, that we delay relaxation of the restrictions, the more we suppress levels of community transmission, the more people we get vaccinated and protected. And then that gradual easing uh, of restrictions allows us to ensure that we prioritise those things that matter most and the executive has been very clear, the education of our children matters most. Uh, and then in a phased and careful way, as Minister said yesterday, uh, look at other e easements and, and some of the other restrictions. But you're absolutely correct. Um, you know, the virus has had a devastating impact uh, on, on children. Thank you for those responses. Um, my, my final question at this point um, for the Minister, um, is around click and collect and in particular um you know i wanted to ask you robin if you are accepting the fact that there are shops providing goods for instance for expectant mothers um uh, and new mothers such as baby shops and they really need to be open and, and open soon even on an appointment basis so has there been any um progress on um an issue as vital as as, as that um, at this stage? I, I think, Pam, it's one of those things um, when we introduced or relaxed our, our approach to click and collect towards the end of last year, um, we did see, and I think all the ministers have been on record, we did see the abuse of it. Um, so there is a caution as to how, how we actually manage that. Um, ourselves have been, or sorry, ourselves and health and the Department of Economy are now. Um, Working together, I think, is, is the, the best way it could be described. Uh, the Minister of the Economy has brought forward a paper 
um, on click and collect. We would be cautious about introducing in the game because our message still is um, stay at home. Um, online deliveries, um, you can buy online delivery online. But what we've asked the company to do is go and look um, at that specific list of essential retail, non essential retail, uh, and come forward with, you know, with a very specific risk. You know, in regards to the support of new mothers, especially in regards to premature sure baby, you know, there is, you know, it's not we're not doing this because we're called heartless and, and unsympathetic on un understanding. It's how we how we manage the, the the risk that additional travel and additional opening of shops and centers bring. So, you know, the Department of the Economy is working uh, with us and we're working with them as to how we get a very specific section um, of shops that we can safely support and open them on a collect click, click and collect basis. But I wouldn't be, and I would be clear, I wouldn't be uh, supportive of going back to widespread click and collect at this point in time, as to where we see, still see uh, uh, the spread of COVID in the community. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pam, and thank you, Minister. Um, so I'm going then to Paula, then Jerry, Carol, Jonathan, Cordia, and I do have Cara indicating as well. So go ahead, uh, Paula, please. Um, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Minister and Chief Medical Officer. Minister, during the course of yesterday, it transpired that all five trusts had opened up their vaccine programme for um, the community voluntary sector to come forward with, with very little scrutiny, might I add. Um, what do you say to those people who have shielded for the last year, the carers and those people who want to be care partners for their loved ones in care homes? What do you say to them about how this process has been handled? And since all five trusts um, um, adopted the same approach, who took the policy decision to allow them to do that? Thank you. Um, thanks, Paula. There, there was an approach made for um, our trust to open up to the community and voluntary sector. Uh, we work in partnership with us to deliver services and actually direct on behalf of some of the most vulnerable and isolated people in our community. So it wasn't about wide scale opening up to the voluntary community sector. I'm aware that some trusts uh, did take a step outside that and actually issued um, letters to their entire, entire voluntary community sector uh, contact base, for want of a better word. Uh, when that was first made aware, um, when we were first made aware of that, it was actually the Belfast Trust. We contacted the Belfast Trust and they withdrew the wide scale um, invitation and it was focused back down then to those community and voluntary sector who do work in partnership uh, with both the Trust and the Health Department in regards to delivering our services. Uh, and look, I, I think to put things into perspective when the community, I think the Belfast Trust actually vaccinated some in the region of 360 people out of an entire cohort of. 42,500 to date. So what I say to, to those people who received the vaccine, um, you know, please come forward for your second dose because we don't want to waste the first dose. If they are working in those sectors that are supplying that direct support to those most in need, those people that you're actually talking about who are shielding, um, that's why they were called forward. And thus there was a mistake made by the Belfast Trust in regards to the widespread contact test that they put out, and they pulled that back very quickly. And it was a very um, not small number, uh, 260 plus, we actually received the vaccine. Um, thank you. Minister, you said in your opening remarks that um, you were moving rapidly through the vaccination programme and that by the end of February you would have um, reached priority groups one to five. You will be aware that in the vaccination deployment plan, you had, it has indicated that you will get to group six. Group six are the carers. Why are they not going to be um, vaccinated by then? And also, it's come to my attention that there's an issue around data sharing between your department and the Department for Communities around those who are in receipt of carers allowance. Is that is is that what is holding up carers being brought forward? Thank you. No, it's not, Paul. Um, I, I don't know where you're getting that information, but it's it's not related to to the vaccine program. Um, because the carers that will be identified to come forward for vaccine will actually be done through through trusts and GPs, um, not through my department. Because I think one of the challenges that we've actually had and one that has come to light um, through this pandemic is that we don't have a central carers database um, across any of, of the departments. So there is a, uh, a sharing, I suppose, of carers, uh, carers identification with themselves, 
education, communities, uh, and even I think in into justice as well. So there's there is a there is a, a data deficit I, I think across government and how we identify carers as well. So bringing forward our carers uh, group as well will be brought forward as they are in group six uh, and will be following the, the clinic legs thing as well because we do recognise uh, the support they bring, but it would also be you know in that direct uh, line um, of the JCBI guidance, which is fair as carers as, a, as one of the priority groups. Okay, thank you. Minister, the, the, the issue about the recognition payment um, for health and social care staff, this has caused a lot of um, concern and disappointment amongst non-trust staff, and I'm talking about dental nurses, um, community pharmacy staff uh, and others who, who don't run their organisation, um, their, their um, healthcare provision, but they do feel that they played a vital role in the pandemic over the last year. Um, is there any move to actually bring in non-trust staff into that um, payment? Um, well, the first trust trust payment that I made the one that they are open to everyone that's on on the ASO payroll, that includes doctors, community dentists, and anyone who's on, on the agenda for for change staff. Um, it is my intention to make it a, as wide as possible. We followed actually the Scottish model, um, was where the, the initial uh, recognition payment was made. So that's where we took our first um, our, our first go at that. Now, I suppose one of the differences that we have seen in that original, um, original take of this and the original ministerial direction um, that I made in regards to that payment was the Scottish model did not include agency workers. Um, so it, is my, it will be my intention um, that those agency workers who are either on agenda for change um, terms or, or actually less, uh, unfortunately, in regards to some of the agencies that they actually work for, that they would also be eligible for for part pay and welfare recognition payment as well. Um, because that wasn't in my initial ministerial direction, I'm going to have to make another ministerial direction uh, to do that. Um, so I would be I, I would be hopeful of support from my other executive colleagues on from the Minister of Finance and, and Progress and that as quick as we can. Again, it comes through um, part of the challenge it does bring as well as being able to identify across all, all sectors and all trusts about who has actually been working during the, the period that from uh, has been employed through an agency or via an agency. Okay. And lastly for me, Minister. Um, sorry, it's about GP practices in terms of their rate and performance. Um, some um, GP practices that I'm aware of are only fascinating, for example, on a Wednesday afternoon. Who's actually monitoring the rate at which they're actually um, bringing their patients forward? Thank you. Um, one, of, one of the things we, we have done, and again, it's um, some of the GP practices are actually operating like a mass vaccination uh, set up and centre so they can work with uh, social distancing, so they can uh, book um, you know, other, other venues, should there be community halls, uh, or actually get staff uh, into place to deliver that mass vaccination programme rather than and running continually over a number of days. So there are some GPs when they receive their when they receive their allocation of, of each delivery of the Oxford AstraZeneca actually program a mass vaccination clinic uh, rather than running it over over a number of days when they do have that additional challenge through social distancing and hygiene and just the management and inviting cohorts forward as well. So rather than bringing forward people uh, over a number of days, they do it in one blog booking as well. So that's and it is about more of the efficiency of delivery. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Paula. I'll go on then to Jerry. Jerry, Carol, please. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Minister. Um, my, sir, my first question is around private healthcare capacity. I've obviously raised it uh, before. Um, I, I believe firmly that it should be utilised for public control. Um, and to help obviously tackle COVID, but also to tackle the, the ever mountain waiting lists. Um, and it is um, really sickening that some private providers are boasting uh, that they've never had it so better in terms of the amount of patients that they're seeing at the minute. And it is, it is obscene that, you know, people can't get treatment if they can't afford it, um, creating an effect of two-tier health service where if you have £15,000, you can get 
uh, treatment. But if you don't, you're forced to wait on the NHS waiting list like everybody else. And and I'm concerned, and I, I raised it um, in passing in the assembly this week, but in an answer um, to to the department around what is the private healthcare capacity uh, in, in the north in terms of beds. Um, uh, I was told that um, that information is not readily available and it couldn't be collected without disproportionate costs. So I'm just concerned that that's not even seemingly on the radar of the department as an avenue to uh, deal with the, the, the pandemic and also um, uh, the, the, the increase in waiting lists. So I just wanted to ask the minister, uh, is there any further work being considered uh, by his department around that avenue? And if not, uh, why not? Um, Jerry, I suppose maybe just to, to segregate the, the two points um, you raised, and that's one about taking over the private facilities. Um, but being your, your political ethos or the better utilisation of the maximum, uh, utilisation of what is, what is currently there. Look, between April of last year and the end of January this year, we've put 4,200 patients through, um, through our local um, healthcare our private healthcare facilities as well. So that's using the, the capacity that, um, that we're able to, to ascertain from, from us. They have made some steps uh, in regards to increasing capacity and making more lists um, available to us. Um, we met with them um, I think a number of weeks ago now and they, they were able to release an additional 112 theatre sessions um, that have been made available to help treat uh, suspected, um, suspected cancer and those time time critical patients as well. So we, we have that work and engagement. Um, they actually have downturned some of their non um, urgent capacity to be able to fit in some of our urgent capacity as well. So it is a bit of a work on partnership, um, I think is the best way I can describe it, where we are progressing our relationships, uh, I think at, at pace as well, so we can get as much utilization from them. And it's not just looking at ourselves, not just looking at the independent sector, um, here, we're also working with the independent sector uh, in the Republic of Ireland as well uh, to get as much capacity and as many patients as we are um, seen uh, as quickly as we can. Because, as I, I know, as I said earlier, and I know it's something that we do agree on, um, the reason we have to do this is because we failed to, to invest in our national health service proportionally over the last number yeah. of years. Th thanks for that, Minister. And, um, you know, we were told it, it is an unprecedented period and the fact that we've got, um, I don't know how many, but a sizable number uh, of beds and capacity that uh, we're not saying this, they will be utilised for the public fight in a pandemic is quite uh, uh, unbelievable. Um, not just from my perspective, but from many other people's perspective. And I, I strongly suggest that that needs to be looked at in terms of you know, the state has done many things in this period, many things that they would normally have done. Why can't um, private healthcare capacity be utilized for the uh, the battle against this pandemic? and also um, the Fed against the, the ever-increasing wait lists. But I'll, I'll move on there. Uh, just in regards to the, um, the payment for health care workers, um, just a bit of clarification, if, if I can, on that, Minister. Um, a, a, a concerns have been expressed to me that if it is on a pro rata basis, um, I don't know if it is, but it will be negatively impacting uh, on part-time workers uh, and mostly female uh, in, in that regard. Uh, and also there's... Um, uh, the situation around student, the student payment. Um, I think it's the economy minister, but in regards to um, the payment for for um, students, um, will all medical uh, students get a payment, or is it only uh, some? Can we get a bit of clarity uh, on that as well? Thanks, um, Jerry. Again, it is, it is pro rata that has um, that has been communicated across because again, as I said, we took the initial um, basis of this or our initial framework. Um, from the Scottish model, uh, and that's where, where, where we took that basis from, that's the approach they took as well. Um, one of our rationale um, for doing that was actually it gave us a common platform um, with Scotland uh, then to approach Westminster in regards to taxation and HMRC implications to both payments, because there was, well, sorry, my, my thought, that's my, my thought, uh, uh, and, and I'm working in conjunction with my Scottish colleague that on a common platform, uh, on a common payment system, we could approach uh, on a common basis. Uh, I can't make that approach to, to Treasury because it's not within within my remit, but the Finance Minister has uh, a, 
plan continues to do so. The, the community minister as well is also making sure or are approaching to making sure that it doesn't have that, that adverse impact as well on payments. It's something we haven't got guarantee on, um, but I thought there was, a, there was a benefit of going forward on that joint platform, at least across two of, of the four nations, the two that has made um, that acknowledgement payment. Um, in, in regards to, to, to the healthcare, um, I, I need to be clear that that £2,000 is directed towards our, our nursing and midwifery students and some of the the, the other healthcare students as well who were unable um, to take up other paid placements because they were in that position. And I think it was been with a number of members of the committee as well that they would be paying um, our student nurses. Um, as England had taken the approach to do, I made it clear uh, and it was uh, that if we paid them, we actually delayed their graduation time uh, because they had to do so many hours uh, superannuary um, before they could, so they could graduate. By bringing in and introducing this, this acknowledgement uh, payment to them, it allows them to complete their superannuary um, unpaid training placement hours and still graduate in time to enter our workforce uh, in June or July. So that's why that recognition payment um, was made at this point that, or that point. I, I know there has been an issue raised by, by medical students. It's, it wouldn't be my intention to include them. Uh, and, and that, I know, organizations have raised. Um, concerns in, in regards to that, um, what the, the differential between medical students and nursing students and what they're, they're able to do on wards uh, does provide a difference. But the, the reason for the 2000 was allow our nursing students to complete their training and come into our workforce as soon as possible. Uh, other medical students um, have been able or would have been able and um, were encouraged to take up actually temporary part-time student assistant posts. Uh, across the health service where they would be paid uh, for taking up those posts, something that many of our nursing students um, couldn't do. So they would be eligible if they took up those paid student assistant posts, uh, they will be eligible for part of the £500 payment because they would be on um, our BSO payroll uh, for any work that they did. They will also be eligible for the £500 uh, student support payment. Um, that the economy minister has brought forward as well. So there's another a number of avenues um, to, for them to, to provide Thanks. support. Uh, minister, just finally and very quickly, Chair. Um, uh, minister, I've, I've got a constituent, a man who's uh, um, has a heart condition and, and other medical um, issues. Uh, she's trying to get a shielding letter. The, the GP is telling her to go to the consultant. The consultant is telling her to go to the GP. Um, can you give a bit of clarity on what? Uh, who she should get a shielding letter from, who she should approach? Um, both avenues are right, Jerry. Um, so some patients get will get a shielding letter from the consultant, one, some will get it from the GP, but one of them should provide it. If you want to send me through the exact details, you know, through the private office, I'll follow up on that. that Thank you. Thanks, Master. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Jerry, and thank you, Minister. Uh, moving on then, Carol. So, uh, Carol Nicola, go ahead, Carol, please. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, good morning, Minister. Um, so I, I have three questions, um, and it's up to you what way you want to, in what order you want to answer them. So the first question is uh, regarding the camp variant, and I know your correspondence, but this variant was growing well before Christmas, um, and it, indeed, there was a suggestion, there was a proposal to bring in tighter travel restrictions, which you voted against. And the question I have is, uh, I mean, obviously this look for me appears to be a constitutional position rather than a health one. So what advice would you take uh, before you voted against it? The second question I have is around CSA replacement and the modelling. Um, you know, what is the alternative arrangements are? Um, and if you could, I note the correspondence to the committee, if you could put on the record that there are no public funds um, being used uh, in order for the CSI's uh, uh, legal bill and in relation to the hyponatremia, what of the 96 risk recommendations you're bringing forward or you're, you're supporting? And the last question is, will you, um, rather than just a high level screening exercise on the, on the draft budget, will you conduct a full equality impact assessment? So they're my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Kara. 
Thanks, Carl. I, I told you the other day I was looking forward to you being here today. So, um, Carl, in, in regards uh, in regards to the full quality uh, impact assessment, I, I don't know if we have time to do a full one uh, due to the time frame that has actually been brought forward uh, due to the consultation and all the rest of it. It will be something we'll be will be taken into consideration. I'll, I'll come back to you on whether we're doing a full quality impact assessment or not on, on our budget proposals as well. I'll clarify that for you, or whether that's been done uh, as a totality uh, for the budget uh, when it's agreed um, at executive level. In regards to what I voted for, what I voted against uh, in the executive, um, you know, I always thought that what stayed in the executive stayed in the executive. But look, I'm happy to have that conversation here because you were a minister on the executive at the same time. Uh, it was actually me brought the paper forward. Uh, that evening, I think it was late in December, I think it was 10 o'clock at night, it was one of those th those meetings with the paper that I brought forward that, was, that we introduced uh, that 10 day quarantine from travellers coming from GB or the Republic of Ireland. Uh, that's still in place, it was still supported. There was another proposal that was brought in on the floor um, at that point. Uh, we actually asked, if you recall as well, that further information be brought back as to um, the assessment of how many people it was going to affect, uh, what economic impacts it was going to have, was it going to have an impact uh, on road haulage, all the rest of it. So there was a, a commitment taken by, I think it was taken by TEO and the uh, other departments to go away and bring back that um, that information for a subsequent meeting uh, where the, the, the issue could be discussed again. Um, um, I, I'm not saying whether that information was brought back, but the issue um, then on that vote or that decision hasn't been raised um, since. So to be clear, what I voted for, I voted against, I voted against a proposal that was brought in the middle of a meeting that I didn't have uh, substantive information to back up. And I you know you've sat with me long enough on, on the executive to know that I, I don't uh, take those sort of decisions without any substantive, because one of the things we've always said as an executive and everybody on it, because any, any decision would also be taken up with uh, proportionality and information to support it as well. So that's where that uh, position fell, uh, fell. And if you do recall on that night as well, the paper that we actually brought forward um, actually then received all cross-party support, uh, which was my proposal on the 10-day um, the ten day quarantine for anybody coming from from GB or, or even the Republic of Ireland and staying over here in Northern Ireland. In regards to your third question, then, which is, well, uh, there's two questions there. there there's one from around the uh, report. We've accepted all the recommendations in the report. We're on record um, as saying that. Um, even before my time, the department they've accepted uh, all the recommendations. Um, in regards to the, the chief scientific advisor, no public funds are being used um, in uh, as taking a, a private matter uh, in regards to, to the legal case. In regards to Chief Scientific Advisor on his replacement, we've actually split um, the roles that, that Ian, Ian was providing while he, he's currently off uh, on, on health grounds. Uh, Dr. Declan Bradley from the, the School of Medicine at the Queen's University, who was the, the Deputy uh, Chief Scientific Advisor, uh, he will represent us um, at SAGE and uh, will also chair our modelling group. Uh, which brings forward the modelling for, for the different pieces of recommendations and information to the executive. Uh, Professor Stuart Elbrum, um, the faculty pro vice chancellor of the School of Medicine uh, at Queen's, will represent us uh, at the UK's new and emergency respiratory virus threats advisory group, uh, or nerve tag, and he'll also chair our strategic intelligence group as well. So that the roles have been split over, but basically. Um, Two different, two different professionals. I think that was that was. Chair, sure. can I come back just very quickly? Go ahead, Chair. Yeah. Yeah. So on a, on a, thank you, Robin, for that on your quality impact assessment. Sorry, Chair, I've lost Sorry. sound. Can you hear? Uh, are you hearing? Char are you hearing, Chair? Now, Minister. Can you hear me now, Minister? Are you hearing me, uh, Robin? I don't think Robin's hearing any of us at the present time. 
No, he, he probably isn't. I'll just will I give it a couple of seconds or what what will yeah, we do? We'll give, it, we'll give it a few seconds because these issues are easier addressed um if it's on broadcasting side, it's easier addressed when we're still online. Um and I'm hoping yeah. that maybe someone on Robin's so Robin might be signing back in, so we'll we'll just give the minister another minute or two. Yeah, the signal's very bad, Chair. I don't know if it's starly or not. Um, I did a Zoom meeting earlier and it was yeah, perfectly it, fine. Yeah, it does seem to be poor this morning, OK? And the Minister has been a little bit hard to hear at times as well, so there may be some issue on their end. Yeah, see, I'm seeing you back on screen, Minister. Can you hear us now? Can you hear me now, Minister? No, I don't think so. Um, I'm just going to give it another minute, and if necessary, then we might need to pause. I, I, I have a feeling that um, I'm wondering if it's something on the Minister's side. Can you hear me, Carol? I can hear you fine. Thank you, Chair. Can I check, uh, Dr. McBride, are you hearing us there? Uh, yes, uh, hearing you loud and clear, Chair. And you're both in the, in the department today, are you? There's, there's the Minister back on visual now. I'm going to check with you again, Minister. Can you hear me now? I can, Chair, yeah. Okay, so we'll try to pick up again with Carol, and hopefully you can hear Carol. Okay, go ahead, Carol. Okay. So thank you, Chair, and thank you, Minister. The proposal um, around doing a full quality impact assessment in the budget, I would urge you to do that. Uh, I know that the Minister for Communities has done it, um, but they're given even just the budget presentation that you give us, there are significant concerns within that. And there are going to be people, according to even your 165 million shortfall, they're, they're going to be adversely impacted. So I would urge you to do that. In relation to the hypolatremia, while you've accepted the recommendations, the department has been silent on the findings and indeed an action plan, unless I've missed this and if I have, apologies on how those things are going to be addressed. Uh, and then in relation to the executive and the Kent variant, um, it was public as soon as the executive happened, what happened? So. Um, lots of things happen in that executive, so I haven't spoken out of school, Robin, and I won't. If it's on the public record, I will. So it is on the public record, so I will mention it. So given the fact that the Kent variant, even by your own correspondence, ha has caused, it will cause global concern in terms of, you know, tighter travel restrictions, passenger locator forms, managed quarantine, um, what you know, are your plans to ensure that the, the the potency and indeed the potential to infect people here in the north or if that matter across this island, what what will you do to ensure that this doesn't happen? Thank you. Um, thanks, Carl. I wasn't accusing you of, of speaking out of school. It wasn't, wasn't my attention. In regards to the hybrid training, there is a full work programme in regards to, to, to working out of that. So, look, I, I'll get that written response to you in detail because I know you haven't been, uh, you're, you're just on to the committee, so we'll get you a written update for that. In regards to your issues around the, the, the budget, I, I, I think I'll check with the chair, but I think my officials are coming on to provide that update uh, directly after this meeting um, or this section of this meeting. Yeah. Um, so, so they can they, they can update you there as well. In, in regards to the international travel, um, I'm not sure if you were in for the chair's opening comments, Carl. In regards to how I believe we need to be working across these, you know, both islands. In regards to international travel, um, I welcome the steps that are being taken. I don't think they're going far enough yet. In regards to sharing that uh, passenger data form uh, information with the Republic of Ireland, um, we had an exchange. There was a meeting that. Uh, uh, at quad level, I think it was Monday week ago, where um, um, Junior Minister Carney and the First Minister myself met, and some of the information coming forward 
uh, from the Irish government still hasn't come to, to our satisfaction where we're, we're getting that full sharing of, of data uh, as well. So there are steps being taken at the at, at First Minister, Deputy First Minister, Taoiseach, uh, Chancellor, Dutchie Lancaster level as to how we progress this because of, I think it will move, move pretty quickly in regards to how we quarantine, where we quarantine uh, and also who we quarantine because I do think we have to do it. Uh, and log step across these islands. Okay, okay. Thank, thank you. I'll need, I'll need to move on then. I'm going to go then to Jonathan, uh, Jonathan Buckley. Go ahead, please. Can you hear me, Chair? Yeah. Yes, I'm hearing you, Jonathan. Go ahead. Okay. Good morning, uh, Minister. Cancer has been one of the issues in which has really touched me throughout the COVID nineteen period. With cancer detections down 20% on average, affecting around 1,300 people, does the minister accept that a return to the operating table isn't the only piece in the puzzle to be worked out, that work is ongoing to enhance face-to-face -face contact and ramp up diagnosis services? De definitely, Johnny, you know, and I think that's one of the, one of the things we did in, in developing that cancer resets, reset sale. Uh, that we did earlier on, you know, and it's not. I think you're right. It's not just about the operating table being the, being the answer, uh, because currently, you know, in, in terms of cancer treatment um, uh, specifically, you know, I, I would want to say, you know, that no chemotherapy or radiotherapy actually has been shown to consult um, and any of our trusts. Uh, both service service uh, both services have been maintained actually throughout the pandemic. There may have been changes to some treatment plans, um, which have been maybe modified in terms of patient safety, and in line also with national guidance, uh, and, uh, and also in you know, those changes that were made, were made in the written consultation um, with, with the patient as well. So you know, you, you're entirely right about how we get that diagnosis um, back up and working as quickly as possible. We've already seen you know, the, the capacities there that we are utilising uh, now on a regional basis uh, for our operations for those level of, you know, the, the P2 um, cancers, or sorry, the P2 operations, you know, we're at a regional level with now over 1,800 people sitting on, on a regional list that can be seen and will be treated across um, any hospital um, in, in an order of priority as well. So there's a lot of work um, goes on also in the utilisation of the independent sector um, as well. So. But, but I would say, you know, and, and cancer is, and as you say, you know, cancer is one of those those diseases that touches many families and near enough every family across Northern Ireland. But there are also those other um, conditions uh, that we also have to recognise are still out there and still causing harm as well. Okay. Minister, another issue which has greatly alarmed me is the adverse impact COVID has had on mental health a priority in which you placed when you first entered office, and rightly so, have received uh, widespread support uh, around the chamber on that issue. Uh, I received a message yesterday, uh, and while we fully recognise that this has been difficult, we are now seeing vaccinations at a record pace, which is to be welcomed, uh, with the hope, and I, I really emphasise the word hope, that we can begin to get society back to some form of normalisation. And I received the message on a day when the COVID-19 infection rate in Northern Ireland is at its lowest since the 1st of October. Some news outlets chose the headline uh, after the interview with the Chief Medical Officer that COVID restrictions may be in place until 2022. Minister, this runs the real risk of destroying hope. People are clinging to the, the realisation that we are rolling out a vaccination programme which could bear some form of normality in the future. Would you agree with me that it is important that not only ministers but indeed officials tread carefully to ensure that we do not create uh, further anxiety um, and diminish that light, that hope that a vaccination can bring in the coming days? Um, and thanks, Joanne. I, I actually, I think in your opening, your opening comments, I think you were very apt. Uh, that some news uh, outlets decided to run that headline. It's a pity they didn't run what was said in its entirety, um, because uh, if they had been present, maybe the chief medical officer gave an hour and a half um, of media interview of briefing, which he does along with other senior officials every Tuesday, and he did say that some hope, and I think that was clarified uh, yesterday at the, at the 
press conference as well, and the chief medical officer was on this call. I think, unfortunately, what was reported in the headline news uh, didn't actually reflect a lot of the substantive um, detail and input that the chief medical officer actually gave uh, to that media briefing, or even if you read past the headlines, mm. uh, what was actually reported and made it many. Um, of those those same stories as well. So it, it is about giving, giving hope as well. But as I said yesterday at the media briefing, it's also about giving that hope uh, balanced with caution because we can't we can't get ahead of ourselves. You know, and, and I know you say, you know, I, and, and one of the things that, that I do caution as well, you know, at sad utilization, you know, our, our rate is now as low as it has been since October. It's not as low as it was in July. It's not as low as it was in June. You know, so it's still high. We're still sitting at a rate. Uh, when we started to bring in those regional um, restrictions, we used a rate of 80, uh, 80 positive cases per 100,000 as an indicator that we had an area of concern. Now, we haven't a local district across Northern Ireland, lower than that. So it's always about when, when you, somebody compares where we are now to where we were at a certain point uh, and date and time that point of date and time may not have been a particularly good point either. So it's always taken those those steps and uh, yeah. those parts into comparison as well. Minister, I appreciate that. And as I say, I think it's important that we uh, don't lose that side of hope that a vaccination brings, but also uh, laying out clearly that roadmap to recovery. And my final question, Minister, and it's something that I did raise uh, in the briefing papers, and I know you have given us uh, correspondence in your table page, uh, papers, in relation to the public inquiry of Dr. Aidan O'Brien in the Southern Trust. I thank you for corresponding on this. I'm deeply concerned as to the grounds for this inquiry. It would appear when we look at other thresholds for public inquiries, it appears to be weak. And, other, and the issues surrounding Mr. O'Brien's fo uh, case focus entirely on administrative issues rather than any clinical concerns or complaints. With the public inquiry costing massive amounts of public money, Surely there is a better way to establish the way forward. Um, I think, um, jo Johnny, uh, no, look, I, I hear the points you're making. The public inquiry has been called. I, I called it in regards to um, that. I, I think of, of, as of the 8th of, the 8th of February, 1906 patient records have been reviewed. Uh, 287 families have been identified. Uh, the panel reviewing actually had nine. Uh, initial serious adverse incidents. I referred to that in my oral, oral statement in November. Um, we have seen three other um, three other concerns or pieces of work that have been um, brought to highlight uh, in regards where we started off with other avenues where we have actually now finished up um, out of public inquiry. So there's a concern uh, as well in regards to the private patients um, that were being seen as well that we don't have of contacts for and help encourage people to come forward as well. Minister, um, I think just I uh, know because probably my time's putting up, but I think and I, I know you've taken decisions like like this before where you're never afraid to go back and rethink and look at the evidence that, that's before you. Uh, you know, and I you've made reference to your statement in the assembly. And I don't believe we have been garnered with the full facts, including the point, and it's a very crucial point, that there were significant prior grievances initiated by Mr. O'Brien against the trust, which had not been dealt with. That was something that we, as a, a assembly, had, had not prior, prior sight of or even reference to in your statement. When I talk to both medical professionals and patients, I have not met one that can criticise Mr. O'Brien's work. In fact, quite the opposite. They believe that Mr. O'Brien has been treated abysmally by the trust, and it is in their actions that should actually be investigated, not a man who has given a lifetime of service. So I would appreciate if the minister could give this further consideration. And if it does go down the road of which the public inquiry seems to be, I would urge him, please, to, to think on those terms of references, to engage the committee on the wider assembly, to ensure that uh, if we do have to go down that route, that we can gain a full picture of all that went on during Mr. O'Brien's time with the trust. Yeah, and I, I think the point you made, Johnny, is you know one of the benefits of a public inquiry because all that will come out, and that's you know uh, another avenue of, of inquiry or investigation may not bring that out, um, and it may prove one way or the other um, where those concerns 
Um, I actually stand as well, but I, I have an issue to public inquiry, and I'm intent on continuing down that road at the moment. Okay, thank, thank you. Okay, thank you, Jonathan. And moving on then to Orlea. Orlea Flynn, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, and Minister, if you don't mind, I would like to just go back um, briefly to the issue of the recognition payment um, that was raised by Paula and Jerry. Um, so I am pleased that, of course, that it's going to include um, agency workers. But obviously, I think it is disappointing um, if that's going to be on a pro rata basis. And I know Jerry already touched on that around, you know, we know that workers that might be on part time contracts clearly have been working um, over and above full time hours uh, over the past year. Um, so I, I, I don't know if, if, if that can be re reconsidered at, at this stage, um, the way that payment will be rolled out. But maybe just some additional questions, um, because there obviously is still a lack of detail. And I understand the department will still be working its way through this. But um, I'm sure that your own office, along with most of the MLA offices, have been getting lobbies from concerned health and social care workers who want a wee bit of clarity on the situation. So um, just first of all, have has the department agreed a date of application? So for example, would the date of application begin from your major statement or from the, the pandemic um, first first began? So I'm, I'm just looking here at no so, so, so I get that. Um, it's anyone between who's been in place between the 17th of March 2020 and the 31st of January um, is the, the criteria date. Uh, and again, something to pick up from, from Scotland as well. I, I hope to have a, a further or a fuller Q&A uh, later today because of the different pieces of work that we did, we, we have done. In regards to the part-time, uh, if anybody was working uh, during the qualified period, actually worked additional hours, they'll be reflected in the payment uh, because your part-time hours and additional hours work will be averaged over the qualifying period. So the payment will be based on the average hours worked per week, and that would be full added to the, the full-time payment um, of the five hundred pounds. Okay, Minister, that that's great. Thank, thank you very much um, for that that detail. Um, and then, just secondly, I, I'm wondering because I'm conscious with the um, when the health and social care workers went out on strike, and I know it took a bit of time, um, almost a year over a year, um, to, to process uh, that those industrial action monies. And I'm just wondering, as you try and progress this payment for the health and social care workers, particularly agency workers, um, has the department approached the agencies who actually employ, um, you know, who outsource those staff to the health and social care service? Because I think that there would be undue delay if that process was gone through the trusts, because those agency staff aren't technically employed um, by the trusts. And then just finally, has any work been done or any thought been given to prevent multiple payments? So for talk's sake, people um, who are working within the health and social care service, but who might have dual contracts with um, the NHS and with private agencies? Um, earlier, yes, there, there is. And, and again, you know, you, you're picking up the fine the fine detail that we're working through about how we actually differentiate that. And as I said earlier on in an earlier answer, I'm going to have to make a further direction in regards to the agencies because they are now what we're going to have to look at them as two, two very separate pieces, um, pieces of all work. Uh, so at this moment in time, we're actually working with their trusts in regards to identifying um, the agency workers and the implications, how many. Um, you know, what sort of payments are being made because there should be some mechanism within the trust to identify them as well. We'll then engage with, with the agencies as well in regards to picking up that, that additional data as well. But it's, uh, it's it was one of the more challenging pieces of work that actually identifying who, where, and when. But your other point earlier, sorry, the, the first point you made. Uh, no, I think you actually covered it there. Okay, um, right. Around so. the agencies with the, the, with the contracts. The engagement, yeah. Oh, sorry. It was I just around um, the preventing the multiple payments for people that yeah, may have again, contracts. Again, it's something we're tying into, and that'll come across. You know, when we look at the agency work uh, specifically, as well as that separate piece of piece of work. No, that that's 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 great, Minister. I, I appreciate those responses. And then just finally, um, from myself, I know it was discussed. So it's it's unfortunate to hear that obviously there's still 
issues there with the the, the data sharing um, on on the island, and I'm even thinking of the the similar problems that we've been having from you know um, east to west. So, with the passenger locator forms that are used, I think it's the home office, home office designs them. You know, from people that are travelling from Britain um, onto the island. We had I had made a suggestion um, a couple of weeks back to some of your officials about you know um, trying to amend that form because there is no section on that form for people who live here in, in the north um, you know to make contact with the PHA or the local contact tracing um, authorities to let them know if they're isolating etc. So um, I know that Elaine had says that she would take that away. And I'm just wondering, is there any update? Uh, does you and Michael have any update if the department's progressing that wee piece of work? Because if it's a case that it is picking up any additional people that's travelling um, onto the island, uh, you know, anything that's going to help reduce yeah. transmission at any point. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll ask Michael to come in on that earlier because I'm sure he's feeling left out. <laughs> No, I'm, I'm very. I'm, I'm enjoying being left out, uh, um, Minister Chair um, and um, members of the Health Committee. It's, it's a welcome relief. It's not often that it happens. Uh, I'm not aware, only of, of particular problems in relation to the sharing of information between the Home Office uh, and the authorities here. Uh, I mean, the uh, in terms of international travel, that information is being shared with us. Uh, we are passing that information on to the public health agency, who are then actively. Uh, following up on international travellers, so uh, and we are, as Minister said, making progress uh, with the authorities in the Republic of Ireland, and that's very much to be welcomed. We have an interim uh, solution in place, uh, which the next couple of days, which will allow uh, individuals arriving into uh, Dublin, uh, our other ports in the Republic of Ireland, to be uh, advised of the legal requirement to complete the UK passenger locator form, and will be directed to the. Northern Ireland uh, NI Direct uh, website. We put that uh, arrangement in place. If you remember when we had the uh, Denmark uh, variant, which was of concern, uh, and you know, as as Minister Nicole mentioned, uh, sorry, as uh, um, uh, as Carol mentioned earlier, um, the uh, obviously we will increasingly see new variants arising around the world, and it's very important uh, that we have both genome sequencing going on, so we are detecting these at an early point in time. Uh, that we have controls in place that will allow us to assess their impact, if any, uh, and that there's sharing of information both about these new variants globally uh, and that uh, sharing of information uh, around travel from those countries where those uh, new variants are emerging is made available to us. So uh, I think there's more work to be done. Um, I think we're making uh, good and sustained progress. Thank you, Michael and Minister. Thank you. Okay, okay, Arlea, thank you. So going then across uh, the final indication I have at this point in time from members is from Chiara. So I'll uh, I'll go to Chiara Hunter there, please. Go ahead, Chiara. Thank you, Chair. Um, good morning, Minister and Michael. Uh, thank you again for coming before us. I'll keep it brief as I know you have to leave very shortly. But just to say it's very welcome news that we have over uh, 361,000 uh, vaccinated so far. So um, my question, uh, I'll give you both at the same time. Uh, recently, I met with community pharmacy representatives, and I'm just mindful they've played such a key role uh, throughout COVID-19, especially with GP closures. They've seen an increase in barrels and footfall. So I'm just curious uh, what kind of conversations you've had with that sector and if you've identified um, you know, any potential additional further funding for them. Um, also, uh, this is an issue that's been raised to me a number of times um, by staff across East Derry working in COVID testing centres. Uh, they, there's a level of real concern around um, uh, they haven't received the vaccine, they're high risk, they're around people who are COVID positive. Um, and then also there's the aspect of if they were uh, to uh, be COVID positive, they would have to self-isolate and won't receive sick pay. Um, so I'm just curious uh, if you can answer them. Thank you. Um, thank Car uh, Carl very quickly. The community pharmacy, um, we, we have a very good working relationship with them. Um, our chief pharmacist uh, meets with them regularly. In fact, I, I think we've uh, an ex I don't know this, this things, but we've, we've progressed the relationship um, that my department and community pharmacy has had over quite a number of years, and, uh, and they work with, we've got a very good partnership uh, up and running in a relationship where we both understand um, each other's uh, abilities and, and needs as well. 
and you know, especially welcome the fact that they were able to pick up on the additional flu vaccine uh, rollout as well, which has allowed our GPs uh, and regional centres to concentrate on the COVID as well. So they, they picked up on that as well as, as, as an additional piece of work. In regards to those uh, people working in the, you know, the testing centres, uh, the direct testing centres, um, that's a facility that's actually subcontracted um, contracted, uh, by the Department of Health and Social Care um, out of Westminster. So they're not they're not our direct employees. But um, if you have the, the concerns that you have, we'll be happy to pass it on to to the, to them who are the you know the employer rather than rather than ourselves. But in regards to coming in contact with COVID uh, positive patients, they shouldn't be because of the setup they have. They should always be doing everything PPE arm's length. Uh, you know, I, I've been to a couple of them to see them in operation at the start, so there shouldn't be any great, great threat of, of contaminating or contact with with COVID positive patients. But uh, in regards to to the supports that they receive, then um, if they are off sick due to contact with COVID, um, we can check up for you. That's great, Minister. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And I have a, a late, a late answer. And uh, I have Alan has come in there from the black side. But in the circumstances, I'm hoping the minister maybe will indulge him. So I'll go across to Alan and check. Alan, uh, see your hand up there now. So go ahead, Alan, please. Alan Chambers. I'm having difficulties. Actually, lost video, but I'll get stuck in my question. If you can hear me, uh, uh, Minister, the uh, we had a lot of concerns around the transmission rates in care homes and nursing homes in the early days. Of this pandemic, and, and now you've managed to uh, vaccinate most of the residents and staff in our care homes. Uh, certainly, I'm hearing some positive uh, trends coming uh, from them in, in relation to uh, transmission rates. Now, I wonder if you could confirm uh, if indeed the, the trends are positive. Uh, the other issue, uh, uh, Minister, I wanted to uh, raise was that last week in the House. Uh, uh, Robin Newton, one of my MLA colleagues, had said that his uh, education minister had appeared in the chamber more than any other minister. I, I'm sure you would probably disagree with that. Uh, but uh, in relation to assembly written questions, I know every member is entitled to five a day and two priority questions. And, and it's clear that, uh, that, uh, that the department, from an administrative perspective that's under most pressure, is your own department. And I'm sure you're not immune from staff shortages uh, around COVID isolating. Uh, I know that uh, one member of NOTA has asked the same question three times over the last few months. Uh, and I know it's part of the routine of most of the members now to direct uh, questions to your department on a daily basis. And obviously vaccinating has opened up another topic for a uh, question. I know that you have personally have no problem with transparency, Minister, but could you give me a sense of the practical implications and difficulties for your staff uh, with the amount of uh, assembly written questions coming into your department. Um, thanks, Alan. Um, in regards to to care homes, um, we are starting to see, uh, I suppose, those early those early green shoots. Um, each care home has been visited once, and hopefully, in the next the next few days, they, they should all have received their second visit um, as well. And from that, we'll start to see, I suppose, the real. Uh, benefits of of the vaccination of, of the second second doses as well, and then just in comparison, you know, it's data that's that's actually available on our on our dashboard. You know, from back even to sort of early January, the eleventh of January, with 150 care homes who were managing COVID outbreaks. Um, as of yesterday, that was down to 83. Um, so there can be impacts from community transmission. Um, but there's also impacts as well from I, I think the beneficial pick up um, of the vaccines as well. Um, and, and your last point, uh, and I do want to, I do, I do I do want to make clear that it's not a it's not a planted question, but it is something that that I have to hand because I think <laughs> and I see the chair I see the chair laughing there, but they, they come on. Uh, I, I think one of one of the things that was actually raised at the economy committee yesterday um, by the Permanent Secretary of the Economy about the high levels of absence um, and the rate it was having on on departmental officials. Uh, so I, I actually asked for some work to be done uh, before the media briefing um, yesterday. Um, to, to date, uh, my, my staff, my private office staff, have dealt with over 18,000 uh, 
pieces of direct correspondence, AQWs, uh, or general inquiries uh, coming into my private office over the, over the past year. Um, and that would be in comparison to the last time there was a minister in place of just over 6,000. So the workload of my private office has trebled. Um, I think one of the other the other pieces of information that I had for yesterday for the for the media briefing was that my the departmental press office has dealt with over four thousand press queries uh, in twenty twenty and twenty nineteen it was nine hundred as well. So that's still working uh, with the same number of staff and the same complement. So um, I, I yesterday I paid tribute to to my departmental staff. Um, because of the workload that they they are doing, they continue to do uh, to a very high level. It's at seven days a week in this department and has been since the start and done at a very uh, professional uh, and high level. Uh, you asked specifically about written written questions. Um, I think as of yesterday, with three thousand six hundred and sixty odd um, compared to uh, when the minister was in post for the last time, it was just over two thousand. Uh, and that's even with, um, I suppose, an ask from the speaker and chief whips for for some members to curtail uh, how many questions they asked, and to make sure that they you know the, the the questions being asked were actually obvious. Um, you, you asked, uh, I don't have the detail on you know of a same member asking the same question three times over the past number of months. But the only thing I can hope that I give the same answer. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Okay, Alan, is that is that you, Alan? That's me. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. No. No. Uh, there's, there's there's no doubt. Um, I knew I knew the minister would be prepared to to, uh, to take a final question there from Alan, but um, and I know it has to it has to be onerous, and, and I think we all recognise that that in a in a in a global health pandemic, an unprecedented pandemic, that there will be unprecedented levels of questions for the for the Department of Health. I think that's. I think that's recognised, but it is obviously an important part of the role of scrutiny, both for this committee and for assembly and, and individual members. So, but uh, we certainly do appreciate, and I think no one is under any illusion that that the department is uh, is, is is working at a high level and and doing uh, doing an awful lot of things that that were that would be totally unprecedented in terms of the volumes of questions and responses. So. I want to thank you both for attending this morning. Um, I know, Dr. McBride, there we have indicated you, you haven't had an, a huge contribution this morning, but I'm sure Aqua Little and will be restored in due course for a quarter of the so, so I've no doubt, I've no doubt that, will, that will happen. Um, I want to wish both of you all the best in the time ahead as you continue to battle this very, very dangerous pandemic and uh, to wish your, your staff and your entire um, your entire team of, of health and social care workers out there who continue to battle very difficult situations. And I do want to note, Minister, the, the comment you made earlier, and I think it's very true. At some point, we have to give those hard-pressed staff some kind of a rest and some kind of a break. They have been working probably on pure adrenaline at times through difficult and traumatic situations. And I think that is something that will have to be considered and planned for and facilitated uh, in, in a way that, that supports those staff um, through what has been a horrendous time um, for them. So thank you for your attendance today, uh, Chief Medical Officer and Minister. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Okay, members, I'm going to take a, a, a short break there. Um, could members come back 11.11 there now, say 11.25 members, could we come back online for 11.25 to resume in public session? Thank you. Sorry, Chair, still waiting confirmation just that we're, we're live. Thank you. That's us live now, Chair. Okay, thank you, members. And uh, we will now resume in uh, our, our meeting this morning in public. And we're going now, members, with your agreement, we'll go now. We have the departmental officials to give us a briefing on the budget. So uh, if with your agreement, I propose we go to that briefing and then we return to the minutes of our previous meeting thereafter. So remember, okay, I'm going to agree with that. Yeah, thank you. So uh, then I, uh, yes, Clerk, were you saying something?
No. Okay, yeah. I heard something there. Okay, I refer, I refer members to papers there at tab six of your pack, particularly to the, ta the clerk's memo at tab 6.1. I can advise members that departmental officials are here today to update the Committee on Budget Matters. And I would now like to welcome by video link Ms. Bridget Worth, who is Director of Finance, Mr. Morning, David Jeff. Keenan, who is Head. Good morning, Bridget. Mr. David Keenan, Head of Financial Planning. Good morning, David. Good morning, Chair. Mr. Andrew Dawson, who is uh, in, in the Investment Directorate. Good morning, Andrew. Okay, I'm not hearing from Andrew just yet, but I'm going to check then. We also are hopefully being joined. Uh, sorry, is that Andrew Dawson? No, yes, Andrew, we're seeing you on the screen now. Good morning, Andrew. Good morning. How are you? Good morning. Very, very well, thank you. And Miss Kira Dolan, who is Director of Transformation. Good morning, Kira. Are you online with us? Okay. Morning, Kira. Can Morning. you hear me okay? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Morning. Yes, I can. Yeah, we're hearing you there. Fine. So, listen, to Falcher you're all very welcome to this morning's health committee uh, we appreciate you, you coming along and giving us the briefing and I'd like you just to now invite you to go ahead and do the briefing Bridge, will you indicate to us how you're intending to uh, organise this briefing this morning please uh, yes, Chair. Um, I'll start by making some opening remarks on the resource position um, before handing over to Andrew to speak about the capital position. Um, and as usual, I've got Kira and David here with me to provide assistance with your questions. So it'll just be opening remarks from myself and Andrew, Chair. Um, so if you're happy enough with that, I will start. Um, and I'd like to start by setting some context for what is, as I'm sure you can appreciate, an incredibly challenging budget settlement for the department. Um, as you'll already be aware, prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, the health and social care system was already under mounting pressure. The costs associated with maintaining our existing models of service were increasing at a pace which could not be sustained within the budget available, and these issues have been further compounded by the pandemic. We require major investment on a sustained basis to rebuild our struggling services and reduce waiting times. In particular, increasing the capacity of our elective care system, whether in-house or in the independent sector, requires a recurrent funding commitment to enable us to invest in the staff and infrastructure required to start to make progress. Unfortunately, the funding available within our draft budget allocation just does not allow us to make any significant headway into this issue, which was already estimated to cost between 250 million and a billion before the impact of the pandemic is taken into account. Similarly, the draft budget will not allow us to undertake a transformation program with any level of ambition. Such a program also requires significant investment to enable us to make the transition needed to a more sustainable service, investment which is again not possible with the level of funding that this budget provides. You will appreciate that we're still working through the detailed implications of the budget settlement at official level before bringing recommendations to the Minister on the key issues associated with the constrained funding position. It's particularly important that we take the time needed to do this work thoroughly, given the difficult choices that need to be made. And the need to do this whilst also continuing to respond to the challenges of the pandemic has meant that this work has not been able to proceed at the pace we would ordinarily have wished. There will therefore likely be many questions you have on whether certain specific services will be funded that I will not be in a position to answer today. However, I hope that the paper will help to give you a sense of the position we're dealing with, and I'll spend some time talking you through the specifics of that. Um, the opening paragraphs of the paper set out the detail of where we expect a uh, final budget position to land, uh, and that would be at some 6.6 .6 billion. Um, this is 495 million of additional funding when compared to this year's baseline of 6.1 billion. And you've got a breakdown there of the additional allocations that make up the 495 million in the paper. To pick out a couple of the key details for the rest of the paper, you'll firstly note that the settlement does not include any additional funding for safe staffing. However, we have been assured by the Finance Minister that this funding will be made available to us at June monitoring and have highlighted a requirement for an additional 20 million in this regard. 
our financial planning is now proceeding on the basis that this funding will be forthcoming. We are also dependent on the COVID-19 rebuild funding of around 250 million to mitigate the pressures which were previously included within our requirements to maintain existing services, to meet some new in inescapable pressures and to fund some of our NDNA priorities. This will not be without its challenges. Whilst one-off COVID funding can be effectively deployed to an extent in providing elective care, you will know that rebuilding services requires us to make multi-year commitments to training places and to appoint people to permanent posts in order to attract and retain staff. And that brings me on to what is the most important point in terms of financial management and the main concern on my mind as finance director as we move forward. Only the 52 million of AFC pay funding has been provided recurrently, which represents a recurrent increase of less than 1%. To put that in context, in 2021, the department received some 400 million of additional funding with 344 million of that provided recurrently. The main constraint on our spending in 21-22 is therefore going to be the extent to which we can assume that funding will be received in 22-23 in order to meet any commitments we make recurrently. With our estimate of pay and price inflation running at around 150 million, it will therefore be very difficult for us to make recurrent commitments in excess of the 250 million mark. Even this will require us to receive an additional 400 million in 22-23 just to stand still. And whilst this is not an unreasonable expectation given the 2020-21 allocation, to go above this amount would run the risk of effectively running up bills that we can't afford to pay. So I find myself in a very strange position today where I'm telling you that we don't have enough funding to do everything we want to do next year, but I'm also sounding a note of caution around the provision of additional on recurrent funding, as we'll be limited in how this can be spent without assurances around the amount of additional funding we'll receive in 22-23. As the Health Minister has said publicly on a number of occasions, what we really need is a multi-year budget to enable us to plan the services that we can deliver on a sustainable basis and to enable us to invest with confidence in the training and increased staffing levels that are required to provide the health and social care service that we all need. And on that note, I'll hand you over to Andrew to provide an update on the capital position. Thank you, Bridget. Thanks, Bridget. Go ahead, Go ahead Andrew. Thanks. Um, a, a, it's a capital uh, briefing paper has also been provided, and you'll see that paragraph one of that paper. Uh, it says the proposed capital allocation for the 2021-22 financial year at 326.5 million. And this uh, represents a, a increase on the uh, 2021 opening budget. And by the course, uh, any of this is welcome. Um, of course, we we still uh, are, are in need of, of further to, further uh, funding to provide funding for all of the projects we would like to be able to do. Uh, there have been some changes to our profile since our November paper to you, uh, and these are set out in Table 1 uh, of the briefing paper. The proposed allocation uh, for 2021-22 will enable us to take forward those priorities that we regard as inescapable, uh, as well as continuing to progress our flagship projects, commence a small number of critical new projects, and provide regular and ongoing investment to the health service and to the Northern Ireland Fire and Rescue Service for fleet and estate maintenance. We have allocated in this financial year, so in 2020 we have allocated £70 million pounds of COVID capital funding to a range of proposals brought forward by uh, health organisations to meet the COVID response. This funding has been allocated for additional equipment in hospitals, including ventilators and medical equipment, provision of funding for PPE storage, a second Nightingale Hospital at White Abbey, increase in medical oxygen supplies, a range of IT solutions to enable the HSC to resume services through new ways of working uh, and to allow the health service to reset and rebuild in a COVID safe environment. Some of the COVID proposals have commitments into 2021-22 uh, and we have, uh, whilst we have received an allocation of 3.6 million of COVID funding for this, we are proposing to set aside a total of 6.5 million for COVID capital funding to include that 3.6 million to meet the uh, current 2021-22 pressure. 
paper does then detail um, it, the flagship projects uh, position at paragraph five, the committed projects position at paragraph six and seven, uh, critical ICT at paragraph eight, and the need to maintain services from paragraph nine onwards. From paragraph 16 onwards, uh, we detail a, a number of critical new projects, uh, which uh, we have provided uh, provide an allocation to of three and a half uh, million. Uh, and with that, I think, Chair, that will just uh, uh, do probably better to go into more detail on, on, bo on both the resource and capital positions just in questions. So uh, I'll, I'll pause at that point. Okay, thank you, Andrew. And I suppose um, the first one from from myself, Bridget, is probably to you in terms of the two hundred and fifty million for COVID rebuild. Can you outline for us how that would be allocated over the budget over this budget period? Okay, Chair. Um, so um, in total, we have received three hundred and eighty million of um, funding for COVID, and uh, as you can see from the paper, twenty-five million of that is for the vac uh, anticipated vaccine rollout costs, and um, one hundred and five million for response. In terms of the two hundred and fifty million, that's the area where we are still looking at work um, on exactly how we will prioritise that funding. Um, it is the only additional funding, really, that we have of, for any discretion. So we are really looking at how that needs to be prioritised across all of those areas. So to meet any uh, any of our pressures in um, 21-22. So um, we are looking at needing to use some of that to um, ensure that we don't need um, to ask our health services to make savings in order for us to afford um, pay and price inflation. Um, so we are using some of that effectively to enable us to continue um, services at the level that they are currently at. And then we are looking at how the rest of that needs to be prioritised, as I say, against the pressures that we identified in our previous paper around maintaining um, existing services around um, uh, elective care and and rebuilding um, back from the pandemic and also um, at the the NDNA priorities that feed into that as well and um, with Kira on the line I obviously can't forget the, the need for us to look at the transformation projects that are on the ground and which of those need to be prioritized from that funding and as I say that's a piece of work that's very much ongoing at the moment. Okay, thank you. And just in relation to that spend, given that it's flexible spend, what plans or systems or procedures are in place around the consultation for the allocation of that funding, or what are you proposing in terms of consultation on that element? So um, at the moment, we have uh, the Department of Finance is undertaking, as I'm sure you're aware, a consultation on the overarching budget settlement. Um, we have provided additional information on our website um, on the um, high level consequences of this settlement. Um, that's now publicly available to assist people, I suppose, in responding to the consultation. Um, and that does include um, a very high level um, assessment of potential equality impacts as well. Um, and that um, is, is also available um, on our website for consultation. But um, as we work through the outworkings of this budget, we expect that particular decisions and particular measures will need to be subject to further consultation at local level where those decisions need to be taken and that they will also need to be subject to the appropriate um, equality, rural proofing and screening at that, that time. Okay, thank you. And my second one does relate actually to transformation, and uh, it's probably there for for Kira. But I'm wondering how this uh, how this budget feeds into the transformation program, and what assessment Kira there is of funding required in future years to implement, and also what projects have been put on hold, or or have been allowed to progress as a result of COVID. I'm not hearing you there, Kira. Uh, I'm sorry. Kira, I'm not hearing you at all. Hey, I'm can back. You just, can uh, you hear Clark, me? Are you Sorry. Hearing? Yes, I hear you now. Thank you, Sorry. Kira. I was on mute. Apologies, Chair. Um, 
So on your last point, there have been no transformation projects paused as a result of COVID. Um, we've very much protected the work that was on the ground in terms of transformation, um, because you know that ultimately transformation is the long only long term solution we have to create a sustainable service. Um, and in many ways, a number of the transformation projects that were on the ground that are on the ground supported our COVID response. You know. Um, like the multidisciplinary teams in primary care really um, paved the way for the COVID centres and um, you know the day case selective care and um, in terms of our experience and, and cataracts protected those surgeries um, and the rollout of the um, day case selective care centre in, in Lagan Valley and um, a lot of the acute care at home and um, ambulatory care on schedule care services really supported the system in terms of capacity and flow and um, when we when we needed it most and I've kind of become very much a, a cornerstone in terms of, of how we get people through the system. So, um, you know, transformation needs to continue, we have no doubt. In terms of where we are with this um, budget settlement, um, I think Bridget has set it out very clearly that um, it's, it's not ideal. Uh, we are anticipating £49 million pounds for transformation. That's not enough. Um, and as Bridget has said, uh, you know, what we really need for long term transformation is multi year budgets because we need to be able to plan what we're doing. This year, we had £44 million um, in terms of uh, allocation for NDNA transformation. We supplemented that with um, an, uh, almost £50 million between um, other pri reprioritized funding streams. Um, uh, you know, dem demography funding that we do have that, that is recurrent. And also we sought some more money, as you know, Chair, we, we've spoken on this through June monitoring. So we have a total of £94.4 million pounds on the ground of um, on population at the moment. £49 million pounds doesn't add up to what those inescapable costs are going to be next year. So we will look to, um, we will look to meet the inescapable costs of transformation, but you know, those are the inescapable costs of projects that started in 2018. And while it's very valuable, we do need to be looking at what we need to be doing now in the context of what we know, you know, post this third wave of, of um, the pandemic. So there's a lot of work going on in the system in terms of I'm undertaking an evaluation of that 94.4 million to see is what we're doing, meeting the objectives of what we set out to do. And also then feeding into Bridget's um, exercise around prioritization against all of the other priorities we have where does this where do these transformation projects sit so um i mean it's i i don't have the, the detail because we don't know at this point and obviously it's it's for the minister to decide what goes ahead and, and how it happens. but i mean transformation remains our only option in terms of long-term sustainability of the system and, and there's a similar question to you, Kira, in, uh, in relation to the consultation. What systems are in place and what consultation is planned for this very key? So this is this is a very key rebuild and, and transformation. Obviously, it was initially impacted by COVID. So what, what plans are in place now to ensure there's full and proper co-design and co-production of all these of all these spends? It'll be exactly the same um, process as Bridget has outlined in terms of consultation and screening on a local level. Chair, a lot of the projects that are on the ground in transformation are pilot or prototypes. Um, but what we need to be doing now is, you know, moving out of the space of that and embedding these transform. You know, if, if these projects are proven successful, moving to embed these into the system so that we can plan ahead. And we're only going to be able to do that with multi-year budgets. Decisions on, on what goes ahead, what we can fund, is going to be so de determined by what else is prioritised within the system. So, I mean, I can't give you any guarantee at the moment of what will happen or not, but know that we're, we're working on it. But you can guarantee, I hope, Kira, that there will be substantive and meaningful consultation. That, that's, I suppose, the key part of it. Absolutely, of course. Mm -hmm. Okay, so listen, I'm going to go across to members then. At this point, I have in the following order here, I have, I'm going to go first of all to our Deputy Chair, Pam Cameron, then Cara, Jonathan, Carol, Alan, and Paula, and Jerry, I see there as well. So we'll go first of all across to Pam. Go ahead, Pam, please. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, panel, for your attendance at the committee today. Um, 
I, I wanted to ask around the uh, the absence of funding for the review of adult social care. So I think that's um, pretty wearing. And I wanted to ask how uh, the absence of this funding fits in with the minister's commitment for reforming uh, the the care home sector and placing care and staff terms and conditions on the same flooring as those within the NHS. So if you could address that, please. Okay, um, I'll take that question. And um, I suppose along with all of our other priorities, we're having to look at what, what can be afforded from the funding envelope we've been given. And this will be one, obviously, of a number of things that, that we'd be looking at how, how it's prioritised. It is a very substantial um, requirement, and, and that will obviously make it harder to fund. Um, but as, as, as I said before, we haven't got to the point where final decisions have been made around um, what we will be allocating funding to as yet. Bridget, and would you have an estimate as to much how much that may cost? So um, the figure I had for 21-22, I think, was around about the £20 million mark. I'm looking to see if David's nodding at oh. me. <laughs> yes, he is. No, yes, he is. Good. <laughs> OK, thank you. Um, and I think the chairs um asked the, the question i want to ask around the, the 250 million uh, um health service rebuild from covid uh, and you, you've said basically that you haven't that list hasn't been um prioritized uh, i just want to ask you then and you've referred already to multi year budgets obviously that's the preferred option that would be there but what what how differently would you be doing things or what would, what would you be telling us today if those multi-year budgets um, were in place and could you tell me what progress has been made towards achieving those multi-year budgets for future years? Okay, um, and I suppose what I would be telling you different would depend on what those multi-year budgets were telling me. I mean, I could have a multi-year budget in front of me that wouldn't change the message. I could have a multi-year budget that didn't that didn't provide additional recurrent funding into future years that actually would mean I would still giving you the same message. I suppose ideally where I would like to be is having a multi-year budget that provides significant additional funding into the future. And that would then give me the certainty to say, rather than I'm worried about spent making recurrent commitments, I would be saying I'm confident about making recurrent commitments to priorities because I know that the money's there next year and the year after and the year after that. Um, but as I say, I could have a multi-year budget that actually doesn't change my message if it doesn't have the right numbers in it, if that makes sense. Um, and I'm sorry, I've forgotten the second part of your question. It was around um, what progress has been made uh, into achieving that multi-year budget. Right. And for future um, years. Yes. And I suppose whilst I, I understand, I mean, that's um, primarily a matter for the finance minister. I suppose I, I, I know that the health minister continues obviously to, to raise the issue with him and in public. Um, and, uh, you know, the, I understand that the finance minister um, continues to um, make that case with his colleagues in Treasury. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Pam. And going then to Chara. Chara, go ahead, please. There we go. Sorry, folks, I couldn't unmute there. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you all for being here today. Um, I have two main questions. One of them is, can I ask the costs around agency staff um, in the last year and also the expected costs for 2021 and 2022? Um, I'm, I'm very sorry, Cara. I don't have that information with me today. Um, it's certainly something, um, if you'd like to follow that up, we could um, provide you with, with that information. 
Great, I'll chase that after this. Thank you very much. Um, my second question is just around, I have seen 127 million uh, is being invested into ICT projects, um, which is a significant amount of money. So I'm just curious, can I get a breakdown of um, costs around ICT projects and the likelihood of them being delivered on budget, if you have that? I will throw that one over to Andrew. Yep. Thank you. <laughs> sure. Um, thanks very much. Uh, yes, uh, the 127 proposed allocation, 127 million proposed allocation for the ICT program. Um, it is quite wide ranging, comprehensive, uh, and covers uh, both in, in, a number of things that are already well in train and uh, hopefully uh, some business cases and small projects that remain to be drafted. To give you the breakdown of the main thing years of ICT infrastructure and critical systems, uh, the, the, the amount allocated to that is 11.3 million. Uh, the, the Encompass project, which is our, our sort of our main uh, ICT project, the biggest one this, uh, this year, our proposed allocation for that is 52.7 million. Uh -huh. uh, the, we then have um, some uh, the technical enablement projects, so that's essentially upgrading the, the, the operating systems, etc. just so that they're in use. Uh, that's 30 million. Uh, there are approximately, there's been 20 million allocated towards ICT business cases that we're aware of that will be coming, but are still being drafted at this stage. And then with the other main number is uh, six and a half million for uh, the ongoing laboratory information management system um, uh, uh, scheme. There are small items as well. For example, uh, the business service transformation project replacement is, has a million allocated to it. Uh, I can't provide this uh, for, to you in writing, but yes, that, that, those are, I suppose, the main points. In terms of the, the, the possibility of them being delivered and delivered on time, again, um, this is, I suppose, it, it, it's complex. We always aim to, to both give a robust um, analysis of whether something can be delivered on time uh, and in budget or not, and if not, then we cut our claw off and or, or change our, our, our schedule accordingly. Uh, so at the moment, those figures that I, that I just read out to you are basically our, our uh, I suppose, our our best estimate at the moment as, as to the amount of money we can spend in 2021 and 22. That will probably be subject to change. Um, there will be a number of in-year monitoring periods where we change our assumptions and change the amounts, etc. But at the moment, those figures are based on what we think can be spent uh, in 21, 22, but I, I will caveat that with the, 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 it's always a moving fee. It's not just an ICT, but most of the capital projects too. Okay, Andrew, thank you so much. That's a, a really detailed answer there, very informative. So thank you. I just have one last question. Uh, I've seen that £10 million is to be invested in mental health. This may be a question for the minister, but um, has it been identified, identified how and where this money will be spent? Would you have that information? Um, yes, and I suppose this was funding that we had previously received under um, confidence and supply for mental health. So it actually relates to things that are actually already on the ground. Um, so there's around about half a million of that is contributing to the running costs of the new acute mental health inpatient centre in the Belfast Trust. Um, and um, around 4.6 million of it is um, being invested to ensure that we maintain um, psychological therapies at existing levels. The rest of it really um, has gone towards ensuring that we were able to meet some of the inflationary pressures on the service uh, um, up until, as I say, up until the last year. Um, so inflationary pressures emerging prior to 2020, 2021. I mean, obviously recognise that there are probably rising pressures as a result of COVID and, you know, any additional funding over and above this 10 million, which as I say, has already been deployed, will have to be considered for prioritisation alongside the, the, the rest of um, the areas as part of that 250 million, as I mentioned. But that's how the 10 million um, has been spent over the last number of years and um, will continue to be spent in, into the future. Fantastic. Thank you, Bridget. And I'll come back to you on the agency costs after this. Okay. <laughs> Thanks okay. very much. Cheers. 
Yeah, um, just just before I go to Jonathan, there's a couple of wee things to follow up on. Just on the agency question, if you could provide that response to the to the entire committee, please. And also in relation to Chiara's point there on the on the on the inflationary element of the the mental health, Bridget. Do you mean inflationary in terms of inflated demand rather than financial inflation? Yes. Okay, because I am aware that there there appears to have been between the first surge of the pandemic and the second surge, psychological support for nurses in in critical care have been reduced, and I'm just wondering that seems an awful lot of a almost that makes it almost a contingency fund. So it almost seems like the half of that budget is contingency. Surely it's needed right now more than ever. So therefore, you think it will be being mobilised now, and also does the workforce exist? to be able to spend out that five million in psychological support? So that is that is um, support that's already on the ground in terms of psychological therapies. So that is already, um, we've had this 10 million pounds now for a number of years. We've just never had it recurrently. It's come from the confidence and supply funding. So that is part of, our, that was and, and is part of our existing service um, prior to the pandemic. But are you indicating then that you expect or you're planning to, uh, to be able to cater for a doubling of demand if you're going from the, the you've, you've allocated 4.5 plus the half million, leaving 5 million in the, in, in the uh, contingency for inflation, as you refer to it? Do you no, think it's um, going to double? Is that what you're saying? No, apologies, Colin, that... Um... When I say that's been used to deal with um, rising demand, that's rising demand pr again prior to the pandemic. So that five million was already required to deal with ri rising demand for mental health services before we factor in any further increase that might be required as a result of the pandemic. And it's any further increase over and above this 10 million that I'm talking about when I say it would need to be prioritized from the 250 million pounds we were talking about earlier. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I do understand that. And then then going back to the question around workforce, does the workforce exist to be able to to uh, increase the service? And and also another question just in relation to that, does this does psychological apply to CAMS as well as adult services within this discussion? Yes. So um I don't know if I think that it includes CAMS, but I would need to double check that. Um it, uh, sorry, and I've now completely forgotten the first part of your question. Apologies. Um, do, does are there are there workforce issues around being able to meet the demand and 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 draw down the budget? Are there any okay. workforce constraints in the psych in the psychological support? Yeah. So I don't expect there to be in this particular element because, as I say, that's that's support that's already on the ground. It is something we would obviously have to consider in terms of um, any increase that we might be able to afford into 21-22. And obviously, deliverability would form a key part of our assessment of, of any funding allocation we might make. OK, thank, thank you. OK, so I will then go across to Jonathan. Jonathan Buckley, go ahead, please. Thank you, Chair. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Can you hear me again? Um, thanks, Chair. Yeah, and yeah. Thanks to the panel uh, so far. I think Cara hits on a very interesting point and something that will be uh, very useful to the committee in relation to the costs associated with agency staff. I think this is probably a point in which has gone relatively unnoticed uh, by many within the Assembly and indeed even in terms of scrutiny here at the committee because I think it will scare us to see the costs and to see that the model of funding for our health service is broken in so many ways and that this element of it in particular needs to be addressed going forward so that we ensure we never get um, our health service into the state again that, that's in prior in relation to staffing. Um, I suppose looking at the presentation in front of me at, at, at present, it is worrying that only 50 million of the extra 492 million added to the health budget for next year is actually recurring. So in reality, it, it is a standstill budget. Uh, so with that in mind, um, 
I suppose the, the, the briefing goes into a lot of detail about transformation projects uh, which won't be funded in the next financial years. So which of these projects, including those in NDNA, will be funded and how are projects prioritised? Okay, I'll maybe pick up in that. And um, as, as I think I said in my opening remarks, we're not in a position at the moment to um, confirm which exactly what will and won't be funded. That's still work that's ongoing. But in terms of how we're doing that, um, we're working with um, policy colleagues and colleagues in the commissioning side of the HSCB to identify and, and to go through really all of our all of the things we would have wanted to do and to work out which of those um, should be prioritised from that 250 million. Um, we will then obviously be pulling that together um, as a recommendation to the minister for him to consider um, whether he agrees with those recommendations or not. Um, but I suppose we, we know from the work we've done already that that obviously um, perhaps given the level of, of pressures that we identified to you in previous briefings on the budget, what we've been given is probably only around, around about 60% of what we asked for, so that there obviously will be um, a not insignificant proportion of things that we will be un, un, unable to fund. Uh, and that is, um, that's, I suppose, the piece of work that we've got ongoing at the moment. How, how soon do you anticipate that piece of work to be carried out? So as I say, it, it's it's underway. It's very difficult to be specific about timeframes because, as the, again, as I said earlier, um, you know, we are we are trying to complete this piece of work with policy colleagues and with colleagues in the board who who are also trying to deal with the pandemic at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so we have to be, you know, we would like to be moving a lot quicker, but we have to be cognizant of the fact that you know, they, this is not their main focus at the moment. Their main focus is making sure that our pandemic response continues. Um, and so the timeframes that we would like to, to perhaps deliver are, are um, you know, we're, we're having to move at maybe a slightly slower spa pace than, than is ideal, mm -hmm. but we, we are continuing to move as quickly as we can. Okay. It seems the commitment to an additional 300 student nurses and midwives over the next three years has not been met in this budget. How will this be addressed and to what extent does this budget assist in any way with addressing the core challenge facing the health service, especially during the pandemic, as you've outlined, in terms of staffing? Okay. So, um as I mentioned, whilst we haven't been given any specific funding by this budget to address those places, um, I certainly um, would be looking at that as part of COVID rebuild. So that is part of our assessment of what we're prioritising, because as you quite rightly say, um, training and, and staffing is very key to the rebuilding of the health service. So that is something that's part of that ongoing exercise around the 250 million. But I mean, again, and you're probably going to get fed up of hearing me say this, but you know, a multi-year budget with sustainable funding is really the only way that we're going to be able to address the, the, the key underlying problems, as you say, which are around training and, and staffing. Okay, and I hear what you're saying in relation to multi-year budget. The term has been bandied about that many times now in the Assembly. I suppose it's just frustrating for you hearing that as opposed to what you're, what you're actually dealing with in reality. But we have to deal with the reality and we have to make inroads in, in terms of addressing those serious staffing pressures and issues within the health service that when uh, the pandemic does subside, uh, that, that we can get back to a place of, of strength in relation to our staffing. Finally, um, the budget may be standstill in terms of resource available, but is there a threat that in areas like, say, for example, elective waiting lists and estates management, it could actually represent a net loss for our health service? I'm, I'm just... I'm slightly pausing there just because I, I see the point you're making. I mean, we will still have available to us the funding that was always, always in our baseline for those things. But I suppose when you look at that relative to the yeah. growing waiting lists, that's probably the point you, you, you're making yeah. that, yeah. you know, the, the waiting lists are now 
worse than they were um, and we already knew that the money we had in the baseline was inadequate to deliver against the demand for those services prior to the pandemic. So um, as I said in my opening remarks, um, the funding that we've got will not allow us to, to make meaningful progress so, um, so, yeah. to that. Well, on looking, at, on looking at it with that perspective, and I think it's a very valid way in which you could look at this, it will be extremely distressing that, you know, essentially the budget does represent a net loss in relation to the backlog of waiting lists and maintenance, et cetera, that's in the system. And that's deeply worrying for the, for the days ahead. And I'll leave it there, Chair. Okay. Okay, thank you, thank you uh, Jonathan. Go on then to Carol Nikhilin. Go ahead, Carol, please. Thank you, Chair, and thank you guys for your presentation and indeed your written brief. It was very detailed, but just to say it was very much appreciated. The question about the 165 additional funds that are needed, which also includes the review of that'll occur, and that's really, really concerning. And there's 20 million needed for that, and that's something that's been there well before this pandemic. But the questions I want to ask are really around, um, for example, are there, are there, because I couldn't find it, so apologies, but I just wanted to know, are there funds set aside or even being considered for the likes of either current or ongoing public inquiries and indeed compensation? That may be for the different trust areas, but just to get that cleared up. Secondly, um, I would really um, ask. Charles, Charles, probably... Charles, sorry, sorry, Charles. Just, Charles, can I just cut across you a second? I just want to check with the panel that they have picked up enough. Your your sound is breaking up a little, so if you can just take it as slow as possible. I caught just enough to get the question. I see Bridget's indicating. So if yeah, so hopefully we're getting enough of that, Charles. But just be aware of it, please. Thank you. So question two. Okay. So okay. So question two is around. Um, the the social clauses for the budget, there's quite a lot of um, particularly capital money, um, but not exclusively capital um, going out. So just in terms of the social clauses and indeed the social value around your procurement, commission and tendering. And my last point, Chair, is I would really implore, and I mentioned this to the Minister, I would really implore a full equality impact assessment on this, given the fact that there are issues, particularly one that was mentioned around adult care, that is, and indeed some mental health services, and again, um, safe staffing, that, that that needs to happen. And just the last bit is £90 million was returned by the department, and yet in all, there's additional money asked for, you know, what, what what is the situation regarding all that? Thank you, Chair. Okay, um, you, I Chair. will, um, if it's okay with you, Chair, I will try and pick up on the um, first and, and, and last points there and, and maybe ask Andrew to pick up on the um, procurement issue um, after that. So first of all, in terms of the inquiries, um, Certainly, I know that they are part of our consideration in terms of funding and, you know, um, to the ex I can't obviously confirm um, a, a, a position on funding for those, but I, I, I think I would be feel fairly confident in expressing a sense that I would be very surprised if they were not sufficiently high priority to be funded as part of that exercise. But obviously that is um, ultimately um, for the minister to decide. Um, and then on the 90 million, um, you will have seen, I think the finance minister announced yesterday um, an additional 175 million for the department in relation to PPE stock. Um, and I suppose it was only possible for us to make that bid for additional funding for PP because the Treasury had changed the budgeting rules and that was a change that was only communicated to us relatively recently. So effectively when we were looking at what we could spend 
as part of the January monitoring round, we, we weren't able to avail of that rule change. So we weren't able, I suppose, to spend that additional funding at that time. But now that we have got this change in rule, effectively, we are able to um, charge our PPE stock to um, the 2021 budget. And that will then enable us to um, sort of pre-fund PPE that we'll use next year. Um, so effectively, um, this has allowed us to claim back the 90 million that we surrendered in January monitoring and, and use it to reduce um, costs that would otherwise have scored to the 21-22 budget. So um, that has um, worked out um, quite well for us in that sense. Okay, and then are we going to Andrew for the other element? No. Not here, there, Andrew, sorry. The point about social value in uh, in uh, Andrew, uh, uh, sorry, term. sorry, I need to stop. Andrew, we're, we're catching very little. We're catching very little of that, Andrew. Um, can you hear me? Andrew, kind of cut across you there. Yeah. Um, I'm hearing you in bits and pieces, but we weren't we weren't hearing enough to follow you. You don't have a headset available or earphones? Uh, yeah, give me some. Give me some. Sign back in there. Yeah. Okay. How's that? That any better? Try it there. It's, it's, I think that's a bit better now. Yeah, go ahead, Andrew. We'll try that. Okay, yeah, yeah sure. Uh, and stop me if, if I'm beginning to, to break up again. Um, the this was in relation to the social value clauses in when we procure or uh, commission or tender. Uh, regrettably, I don't have, have the update position on that as part of my briefing for the, the uh, forecast budget, but. I am aware that there was work um, that was commissioned uh, back when the the, the, the published um, and to check the, the position on that. But I'd be happy to write to you just with a with with. The... Okay, okay, listen, listen, Andrew, you're you're very very patchy, but I think we caught enough to understand. You don't have the full answer today, but you will revert to the committee with a written response. So I think, and, and why do we go to other members there, Andrew, if you could just check if there's a way to improve your sound in case we need you back in on a future question. Yeah. But for now, I will, uh, okay. So, Carol, is, have you the three elements there happy enough, Carol, apart from that final? No, no one's mentioned, no one's mentioned a full a quality impact assessment at all. Oh, apologies, Carol. Okay. Um, so yeah. I think... Okay. Um, um, as I say, we, we have done, I suppose, a high level sort of assessment of the impact of the budget, um, and that is available on our website. Um, we we will, as we move forward and make further decisions, need to do further equality impact assessments and, and screening as necessary. Um, but we, we're, we're not obviously in a position where we have sufficient detail to do that at the moment. Chair, can I just make a, a wee point? Um, I mentioned this to the Minister earlier in relation to the Department for Communities, where they were able to say if the relevant funding wasn't made available, these are the things that the Department couldn't do. And that's, that's a full quality impact assessment. Given the amount of things the Department can't do, even by its own briefing, I would really urge that quality impact assessment to start now, um, because it's quite clear that um, there are people with who are really vulnerable are going to be um, disadvantaged if not feel that they've been discriminated against if the full EQIA doesn't happen. And Andrew, you broke up there badly and I heard you said you would direct, but could you also include when you're feeding back in your response about the social clauses, um, why the public health agency are making community and voluntary sector groups, small groups, tender um, and provide substantial funding in advance of completing the tender application, which they don't have. And effectively, it's going to mean that those groups are not going to be able to apply and that's going to have a direct impact on services within the community. 
So if you could follow it up as well. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, and uh, I think the clerk will have noted that if if to to get that if, that final request across. Thank you, clerk. Okay, so I'm going to Alan then. Alan, go ahead, please. Uh, Chairman, the uh, Ben Go report is uh, our roadmap for uh, transformation uh, progress, uh, and I know it's been sitting on the shelf for four or five years now, gathering dust. But uh, given our our current budget position and and dealing with this pandemic and also, we don't have long-term forward budgeting in place. Uh, what do the officers feel is the earliest we could see progress on Bengoa uh, from a financial position? Okay. Um, Kira may have some comments here in terms of the transformation agenda, but I suppose um, maybe just to make a comment at a high level, it. it I suppose when you only have a one year budget, it's difficult to know beyond that one year, um, I suppose is the fundamental point. But but Kira maybe um, can yes. perhaps add a bit more colour to that. Julie, Bridget, yes. Um, and uh, the, the, the Bingo report um, and the, the result in Delivering Together, which was launched by the Minister in 2016, um, I, I think it, it, it um, wouldn't be accurate, entirely accurate to say that um, it has been gathering dust. Uh, as I said, from 2018 to now, we have invested almost £300 million pounds in transformation, which covers the whole spectrum of the uh, of the health and social care system. And so in terms of supporting retraining, recruitment, um, upskilling of staff, in terms of supporting secondary care, primary care, investing in community services, investing in prevention, and the four aims of delivering together have very much been driven forward and there's a number of um, significant programs on the ground and as I men mentioned earlier to the chair and um, they have been protected now all being protected at the level that they were um, being taken forward last year and um, such as you know the, the, the significant investment in the day case elective care, acute care at home and um, even work that we're taking forward now in terms of the urgent and emergency care review which was really looking at you know at the, at the pressure our um, our emergency departments were under and how we resolved that and we've now taken forward um, work under no more silos to look at you know trying to take the pressure off of emergency services but to make sure that people can access this, this, the, the care that they need when when they need it so i think it, it you know it, it wouldn't be true to say that the goal has gathered just however i take the members point in terms of the speed at which we want to move forward with, with transformation that we need to move forward with the transformation program. I mean, this, um, these continual one-year budgets um, have meant that the money that we got invested through confidence and supply, we are now continuing on with the money available for transformation to meet the inescapable costs of those things, which started in 2018. And we have not been able to grow our transformation program in the way that we would have wanted to, in the way that we, that we know is the, is the right thing to do. So, um, yes, the funding has been curtailed, but we've always said in terms of transformation that the speed and the pace of transformation will be dictated by the resources available for it. And that includes both financial and people. <laughs> Reassured by the fact that uh, uh, Ben Goa hasn't been gathering dust, but can you confirm then that all this transfer, very welcome transformational work that you've been talking about over the last couple of years, has that all been prompted by Ben Goa? Uh, yes, the, 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 there was a program of work established in 2018 um, to maximise the funding opportunity that, um, that the confidence and supply, 100 million, the first 100 million in 2018 19. And then the second 100 million in 1920 offered, and you know there's a, there's I can share you know a, a detailed breakdown in terms of what that has covered and what that continues to cover to date. If that is helpful. Yeah, no, but I'm just uh, really just trying to establish that in fact the Bingo report, uh, the contents of it are what have prompted uh, the transformational uh, elements that you've been talking about over the last Absolutely, couple of years. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alan and Kira. And going then to Paula Bradshaw. Go ahead, Paula, please. 
Um, thank you, panel. Um, some of the questions I was going to ask have already been covered, but I just want to come on to the um, the aspect of the report that talks about the um, money, sorry, the priorities that won't that have been allocated money at the minute. And I'm looking there at the 8.1 million for the three cycles of IVF treatment. Could you maybe speak to that, please? And also the 10.7 million to rebuild and stabilise cancer. Thank you. Uh, and I'm sorry um, for sounding a bit like a broken record here, Paula, um, but um, we are looking at, as part of that prioritised exercise, exercise around the 250 million, we are looking at our NDNA priorities and the extent to which they can be funded from that. Now, again, we obviously don't have enough money to do all of them, but we will be looking at which of them need to be prioritised and can be prioritised from the funding that we have been given. We, we just obviously haven't been given anything specifically to address those particular pressures. Um, thank you. No, I appreciate that. I'm just wondering, but in terms of that prioritisation pr process, you know, to what degree do you look at the ethical aspects of the health budget? You know, a lot of the women and sorry, couples who have been waiting for a long time for these three cycles to be available, you know, th this will be devastating for them, this sort of news. And also, as Jonathan alluded to earlier there around the extensive cancer waiting list, you know, I think a lot of this news will, will come as great shock and, and dismay to those people who are waiting for services. Uh, and, and I think this is, you know, where being the finance director in the Department of Health can be particularly difficult because I don't think we have anything on our list of priorities that we think is unimportant. I mean, everything that we have on our list represents a service that people need, represents, you know, um, an operation that somebody needs to have, um, a particular issue around mental health that they need to have addressed. So. This is difficult. It's incredibly difficult and it will inevitably lead to some people being disappointed and finding that their needs are not met. Uh, no, I, I appreciate the difficulty with that. I'm just the, the question was really about how do you ensure the ethical um, aspect of that is filtered in? Like, would you work with um, clinicians? You know, who actually helps feed that um, discussion and decision making? So we work um, very much with our policy colleagues and with the commissioners in the Health and Social Care Board who um, have the experience um, of how how you know the, the needs on the ground I suppose in in the trust areas um, to inform that prioritization and I mean I've been very very and as I say that's that's probably what's making the process take longer than it otherwise would because it would be very easy for us as finance people to sit in a dark room and stick red lines through funding um, requests that we don't have a full understanding behind actually what that means to people who are using the services that th those figures on a, on a spreadsheet represent. So that is absolutely why we are taking the time to ensure that our policy colleagues and colleagues in the Health and Social Care Board are fully engaged in this process. Okay, thank you. No, I appreciate how difficult the task is. And I suppose I have a small question. It goes back to the issue of the 127 million for ICT projects. And um, is any of that money going to be allocated to healthcare partners? And I'm talking about probably our GP practices. Some of them are very sophisticated online booking systems and others you can't get through to, on the phones for weeks on end. So I'm just wondering, is there any way of um, so that money will be spent moder modernizing um, those sort of patient facing services in the community? Thank you. I think I think we'll get a chance to check out and yes, test um, the the headset, maybe now. Yeah. Can you hear me? Any... Yes, yes thank you. hearing you better now, Andrew. Thank you. From, um, yeah, I mean, I suppose when you look at the uh, or the proposed allocation of the hundred and twenty-seven million, um, yeah, the, 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 this that goes right across the, right across the service. Um, if I take the biggest um, item on the CT. Uh, allocation, which is encompass, encompasses in its itself a very inclusive project across uh, on social care designed to in, uh, improve delivery and, and 
service. Um, and that does then get, that will be allocated um, to, to a number of partners, or it'll be rolled out to a number of partners, <clears throat> as will the 11.3 million that's dedicated to the infrastructure and critical systems, um, et cetera, et cetera. So budget for ICT general capital and small projects as we would define them. So again, that that has a number of, of specific individual lines in it that would be allocated to a range of partners. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, and Alan, just, just you, or Andrew, sorry, we are still losing bits of you there. It's better, but if, if you're coming back on, just be quite uh, slow, I think, is probably the best way to. And I think moving around there is creating a problem, but, but uh, it's a little difficult with you, but we're getting everybody else quite clearly, so we'll, we'll persevere and hopefully get there. So I'm going to go across now to Jerry Carroll. Jerry, are you there with a question, please? Thanks, Jerry. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. 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 Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Paul. Um, a couple of questions, sure. I'll just run through them quickly. Um, I mean, it is quite concerning that uh, we effectively have a, a standstill budget, as, as has been raised. You know, we've came through a pandemic uh, and there is no uh, significant increase uh, for our health service that is very, very concerning and doesn't bode, uh, bode well or fill me full of confidence, to be frank, uh, for the challenges we face going forward. Um, the, a couple of quick questions. Uh, the 12.5 million sale of property. Uh, and assets, uh, could you get a bit of clarity on that? Um, if there's no safe staffing, uh, additional support financially for safe staffing. Uh, I mean, what is the department's assessment of, um, we mentioned in our previous session that staff will um, need to take some time off, obviously, when this uh, pandemic is over. Some are already exhausted as it is. They will be further exhausted. Um, at the end of this, so how are we uh, confident, how is the department confident that we're talking about we will be able to have safe um, um, health centres, uh, hospitals, because there's no money specifically allocated for safe staffing. Uh, and then finally, um, the the 20 million part of people report uh, hasn't been allocated. I mean, uh, I would like to ask why not, and also if that was allocated, what that would obviously go to, because it is quite concerning. Uh, we've obviously, uh, as you know, done an inquiry into the care homes, um, and the minister has kind of repeatedly referred to the power that people report as his preferred strategy. Uh, and the fact that it hasn't been uh, financed or budgeted for, which suggests to me um, that there's no planned real change in, in care homes uh, from the department's level going forward, despite the fact that there is repeated concerns raised by the inquiry, but also uh, by society at large. So if we could get some clarity on those points, that would be helpful. Thank you. Okay. I'll maybe see um, if Andrew can answer the, the question around the assets first. Yep, I'll, I, I can, and I'll turn the camera off, see if that saves any bandwidth as well. Uh, hopefully you can hear me. Um, the Yes, our expected receipts uh, in 2021-22, you rightly point out, uh, we, we are projecting at this moment in time to be 12 and a half million, and that's made up uh, from two million uh, of asset sales, uh, £100,000 of uh, repayments under the financial transactions capital scheme, uh, £2.4 million uh, of uh, HSC research and development income from external organisations, uh, and £8 million uh, of budget cover is also provided in that uh, to, each, to our five main trusts for commercial income that they receive to carry out clinical trials. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, I'll pick up on the other two points then. I think the first one was around safe staffing. Um, whilst we haven't we haven't been allocated money for safe staffing in in the budget, we are we have been given an assurance that it will be forthcoming in June monitoring, and as a result of that, we are planning on the basis that it will be forthcoming and we will um, continue to move ahead with, with those plans. Um, and I understand that that is primarily focused on um, increasing staffing levels in, in particular areas. So, um, as I say, whilst we haven't actually got a, 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 the money in our budget as yet, we are working on the basis that um, the finance minister has given us a commitment to, to find it in year 
and that um, we will therefore be able to continue with with those plans as we had expected. Um, is, that, on is, that, is that 20 million, that figure, sorry? Is that the figure that it's being promised or being suggested? So, 20 million is the figure we have asked for. I don't believe we have a specific, I don't think there was a specific amount on the commitment mm. in, in terms of what the finance minister had said. He had committed to giving us funding for safe staffing and our ask is 20 million. Um, I, I think we will obviously we will obviously be expecting the 20 million, but I couldn't comment on whether the finance minister is intending to give us the 20 million he has committed to giving us funding. Okay. Um, okay. In, in terms of power to people, I mean, it's, I suppose it's a similar um, answer to the one I gave um, to your colleague, um, Pam Cameron, earlier. We haven't received um, specific funding for power to people. And obviously, if we had, that would have enabled us to specifically take that initiative forward. But what we are doing is looking at that alongside all of our other priorities as part of our work on the 250 million but um, uh, it's a significant sum of money that we'd estimated was needed. Um, and that was around um, providing sustainable pay levels to those providing social, social care and to test and promote new models and additional training to support new ways of working. Um, and as I say, um, we are looking at how we prioritize the money we've got and whether there are elements of that that are deliverable within that envelope is something we would still need to um, confirm on completing that work. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jerry. And uh, Orlea, go ahead, Orlea Flynn, please. Thanks, Chair. Um, and thanks for the, the team of officials for another um, really uh, detailed briefing that you have gave us today. Um, I, I don't really want to start off on a, uh, a negative note. So I'm pleased to see in the, the briefing that we got, um, I'm pleased to see the in the committed projects, the new facility at Hollywell, the new mental health facility, that that's progressing to the stage one, the, the design phase. Um, because I think that will have a big positive impact um, for people that need that um, that level of mental health um, support. And I can see also that the health facility in the Southeastern, um, the Southeastern Health and Social Care Trust is contained within the critical new projects as well. Um, but I suppose looking at it overall, I am pretty worried um, about the levels of investment and prioritisation around mental health in general and on three sort of different fronts. So I think I'm concerned that the overall budget um, is probably, I mean, the last that I met with the minister in November, he was saying that the, the mental health budget from the overall health budget is somewhere in between five to 6%. Um, so I'm assuming that that hasn't increased at all. Um, I would be interested to know if it's decreased based on this budget. And I would appreciate if you could um, provide in writing a breakdown of um, what additional uh, bids have been made in the context of mental health, child and adult mental health, um, and what additional money has been allocated that breakdown, and to confirm what the mental health share of the overall health budget is, and, and where it falls between, if it's still falling between that 5 to 6%. Um, in relation to the COVID money uh, and the 380 million, um, again, I'm still sort of unclear as to how much of that funding um, is intended to, to go towards uh, mental health uh, facilities um, or services. I know that in the COVID mental in the mental health action plan that had the section on COVID nineteen contained within it. Um, I have spoke with the minister around this and I know that I think it was in the October modern round. Um, I think he made a bid for 2.5 million and that went towards additional nurses and the talking therapies. So my question on that, Bridget, is whenever you had gave the breakdown to Cara around that 10 million for mental health, um, that 4.6 million for psychological therapies, is that in addition to the 2.5 million that was announced previously? Um, and again, I would just be keen to see, you know, what else has come out of that COVID money in, in respect um, to mental health. Um, and then finally, um, the 
the issue around the new decade, new approach priorities, and I completely agree with everything that's already been said. I mean, whenever you look down that list, I mean, it's horrifying that you have to even prioritise between all of those issues because they're all crucial, they're all saving. Um, but for me, I would have particular concern because I mean, we know that there's really, really important strategies that um, are being compared at the moment, and there's a reason for that. So the substance abuse strategy, um, the mental health uh, 10 year strategy and I mean even with the substance use one and I know the minister has prioritised that and, and I'm sure a lot of people are grateful for that um, but if it's where it's going to go um, once it's complete and if it's going to be funded um, we've seen in, in 2019 the figures were only released um, just a short way back in 2019 we had the highest um, level of al alcohol related deaths on record this year um, it was well over 300 um, in 2018. We've seen that uh, the the number of drug deaths has doubled over the past 10 years. And that's not even getting into the level of suicide and self-harm and all the rest. Plus, we know that there's going to be a really detrimental impact on people's mental health um, as a result of the COVID pandemic. So I am really concerned that, um, you know, that about those strategies in, in particular and, and how that work is, is going to be um, carried forward. There's no mention of the, the addictions centre, the centre of excellence that was spoke about for um, dairy. And I've already spoke about the substance use issues and the deaths that, that have resulted in that. Um, so if you have any, any detail that you can provide me um, with on this, I would really, really appreciate it. Um, I'm conscious that some of the funding did go towards the, um, was announced for the perinatal mental health services, and that's great. Uh, but I am just worried about more of the strategic things, um, you know, over the, the next um, number of years. And just finally, in the section where you have mentioned the mental health investment, it's actually described as, so it's 11.7 million for mental health and severe deprivation. And I know, Bridget, that you have gave that breakdown of what the 10 million included. But my first question is, why is mental health and severe deprivation why are those two things, um, why do they both come under the, 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 the one heading? Um, and what is the breakdown of the 1.7 severe deprivation? And I'm just not clear on why that's attached on to the issue of mental health, because clearly if we want to get serious about dealing with health inequalities um, and saving money through the health service, because oh, I mean, yeah, yeah. the billion a year is spent on drug and alcohol death. So if you could just explain um, th that issue of severe deprivation. Thanks. Okay, um, I'll try and pick up on on most of the themes that, that you raised there earlier. And, and you know, if, if I've missed anything major, you can you can perhaps um, let me know. Um, we do have a list of all of the um, specific mental health um, amounts that were included in our initial budget assessment in the paper that you had back in um, sort of November time. And that totals around £46.9 million pounds of specific pressures. Um, we know there would be other, other um, items included in our general pressures around demographic growth and um, pay and um, inflationary pressures in addition to that. Um, I have that list here if if you would like me to run through it or perhaps it's something you would prefer to receive um, at a later date. Um, in terms of the 11.7 million, um, the only reason that is added together is simply because both of those things were things that were previously funded from confidence and supply. So it's really just for us uh, in finance, we think of those two, two things together because they were both previously non-recurrently funded from confidence and supply money. So there isn't necessarily any operational or um, other intent in terms of linking those but the 1.7 million of severe deprivation money is being used i believe for um daycare centers to provide those um to people um who are, are partic children particularly in need and their families so it's the operation of child care partnerships across northern ireland who provide that um quality accessible and afforded affordable daycare for children in need and their families 
um, picking up on the COVID mental health funding, and you mentioned two and a half million for COVID mental health additional in 2020-21. Um, as I said before, the, the 4.6 million for psychological therapies that I referred to previously, um, that has been ongoing for a number of years. It's just that it's never been recurrently funded. So every year we have to continue to make the case to get that funding to ensure that that provision continues. So the two and a half million absolutely is on top of that 4.6, which has been ongoing and on the ground for, for some time. Um, in terms of the allocation of funding for mental health, um, you know, as I've always said, we're, we're working through that prioritization exercise. But one thing we do when we're looking at how we allocate funding is when we come to a sort of final point and where we're looking at making a recommendation to the minister, um, we do a bit of a sense check because, as you say, we, we're sort of looking at the fact that mental health is recognised as being underfunded. So when we come to make funding allocations, we will look at those and go, does this overall funding allocation increase the share of the budget that mental health gets? Just as a sense check, because we are obviously trying to be on that journey towards increased funding for mental health. Um, obviously, I can't provide any guarantees that we you know we could look at that and go well actually mental health funding is falling but actually given the other range of priorities that's that looks okay we 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 will it's more likely that we'll probably we'll look at it and, and go actually um you know we have allocated a dispro disproportionate amount to mental health because we recognize it's underfunded but we will certainly do that sense check and we will double check ourselves before we make those recommendations. Okay. Thank you. Is that, is that everything covered earlier? Uh, yes, thanks, Bridget. The only other thing was Protect Life 2 isn't mentioned anywhere in it, and I know it's due for procurement in um, October 2021. <laughs> And I'm afraid, again, it's that um, stock answer of it is part of the assessment of our, our priorities from the funding that we have. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, panel. Um, that was that was certainly um, extensive, although there is there is certain key pieces of information that you have uh, committed to forwarding to, to the committee. So I look forward to receiving that. But I want to just thank you all for your attendance here at committee again today and for your uh, comprehensive overview of what is undoubtedly a very worrying and a very difficult situation. And I think it is really, really a significant setback that we cannot get to the multi-year budgeting to do the transformation work, to provide certainty, to assist with recruitment and retention and all of those issues that are so key. I think it's a fundamental building block. But it is a situation we're dealing with, unfortunately, at the present time. So I want to thank you all and wish you all the very best and, and uh, keep safe in the time ahead. And thank you for joining our, our committee this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members. Okay, members, um, if there's anything just uh, out of that budgeting session, I'll take it quickly. I'm then going to have a short, a very short, quick break five or six minutes and we'll be coming back then and resuming with our minutes so just if there's anything in relation to the budget that anyone wants to follow up on go ahead jonathan yeah sure no thank you very much i thought that was a, a very very useful session uh, i think paula raised a very interesting point that i've been engaging a wee bit around with gps on and i think that potentially the committee could could tick up a bit further but it's in relation to that um it infrastructure around the, the phone line system for GPs. We've all heard the stories with some GPs easier to access than others in terms of timeframes, et cetera. And I was talking to one GP who commissioned uh, a piece of work, whereas uh, individual GPs, there was sort of like um, an audit of the number of face-to-face uh, -face appointments that came from um, that GP phone line service, whatever you were dealing with. And, and he, he said to me that this was something that he found quite interesting because there's actually quite a disparity between uh, different GPs across the board, even within practices. Um, and I think that's something that this committee should give further exploration to uh, because we have all heard how people have rang GP services uh, for hours upon hours. Uh, and, and sometimes, yes, um, unnecessarily, but in other cases, very necessary. 
And, and I just think that that's a piece of work that this committee could take up to see if that's piloted by the department, if it's being initiated, and, and see if we can try to fix that system because it's clearly broken. Well, maybe as a suggestion, we would we would maybe write to the department asking them for their assessment of the situation at present, because I'm I'm conscious that these are uh, independent private businesses to a degree, but that the access to them is is fundamental and key to patients. But maybe as a starting point, that we would seek information as to their assessment of to uh, the uniformity of access to GP services. The department's assessment of that would that be a starting point? Yeah, thank you. chair. Can I come in? Yes, go ahead, Paula. Thank you, um, Paula. My, thank you, um, Jonathan. Just to follow on the back of that, um, that was part of the reason why I uh, raised the issue also with the health minister around the response that people are getting when they're phoning up around the vaccination program as well. And we know that the establishment of the management board last June by the health minister was very much about we're going to put back better, we're going to transform um, while we're rebuilding. So I think this is a really opportune time for them to put in place really good systems that maybe do build on some of the um, good work during the pandemic that could be done over the phone or through teleconferencing and stuff. But um, I do think it's a massive piece of work and we could really unlock a lot of services for very vulnerable people. Yeah. Yeah, and and I think I think uh, that that and and encompass and all of those all of those sort of technological advances will be something that we'll want to look at in our forward work program as well. So that'll be an initial start. So um, yes, Alan, we look now. Alan, this on the budget because I'm going to come back in on the minutes after a short break. Yeah, just after a short break. Thank okay. You. Okay. Thank you. So uh, members are twelve forty seven. Could we come back at twelve fifty five, members, please, and resume the meeting then? And Clerk, could you uh, take us offline, please? Sure, just wait on confirmation, Chair. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. That's a slide chart. 
Okay, thank you. So, members, we're resuming now our meeting again after that short break. I just do want to return for one small item in relation to the budget briefing. Are members content that the clerk draft a response to the Committee for Finance outlining the issues raised today and forwarding the department's papers on the budget to the Committee for Finance for its information? Are members content with that? Yeah, I think I think yeah, I think members are content with that. Thank you. Um, okay, so now members, I'm going to uh, return to the minutes. And Alan, can I just check with you if your issue with the minutes is a matter of accuracy or something arising from the minutes? Uh, something arising from the minutes, Mr. Chair. Okay, well, go ahead, Alan. Then, what is the uh, what is the issue? Okay, thank you, Chair. Well, Chair, uh, just uh, the, the purpose of, of uh, what I'm going to ask, I'm respectfully going to seek uh, clarification from yourself uh, around some of your actions uh, at the meeting last week, and I'll also be uh, asking for maybe some input from the, the clerk, maybe on, on technical aspects. Uh, but. The, uh, it really hinges around uh, what a, an amendment is, uh, Mr. Chairman, and the, the accepted uh, parliamentary understanding of an amendment is it can remove words, it can add words, or it can change words in motions or proposals. And indeed, the Stanton orders uh, of the Assembly indicate that an amendment should be taken first uh, before a proposal. Uh, I had difficulties with the uh, proposal that was on the floor last week from Orla, uh, and I proposed uh, an amendment uh, which would have enabled me uh, to be able to support and add uh, my ab abhorrence to uh, the, the whole aspect of the discredited gay conversion uh, therapy. Uh, now, I asked uh, yourself for what was the protocol around my an amendment, and you said that you were happy, uh, happy for me to put an amendment. Uh, you would put it to the members, and uh, you reminded me that I, it was within my rights uh, to put forward an amendment. But uh, you significantly, you didn't seek a seconder uh, for the amendment. So later on in the meeting, Mr. Chairman, you then indicated that. What I had put forward was not an amendment. I said it's a different proposal uh, that is suggesting a somewhat different course of action. Now, I've uh, analysed my amendment that, uh, that I put forward, and the first part of it uh, I had no difficulty with. That was Orla's wording, no difficulty with that. Uh, I asked for the second paragraph uh, to be deleted. Uh, which was the comments around uh, the, the, the third party individual, uh, and then I added words. So I think I met all the criteria of what an amendment was. I removed words and I added words and I changed words. So I think it met uh, all the requirements of, of an amendment. Uh, so I, I'm just wondering if I could just seek clarification. Uh, on that particular point, and, and have another point to make after that, which maybe the clerk can help you with. Okay, well, it was in in, in the course of the discussion, it, there did there did appear and to me to be an element of whereby what you were suggesting was then subsequently picked up by um, or Leah had had agreed to add that, and I think I did check back with you. Were you content? And I reread the the amendment with the addition as a result of the conversation that you had had. But um, so uh, to, to me, while, while there was some confusion in the body of the discussion, when we came to the end of it and I read in the, the, the item for consideration, I thought we had clarified everything by that point. But I'm, uh, I'm, I'm happy to ask the clerk's view of that, or do we need to, do we need to take some, some uh, consideration of that clerk? What's your opinion on this issue? Um, sure, I might need to have a, a chat with Alan in relation to the wording of what he was amending or, or proposing to amend, um, because I know there was a discussion ongoing last week. Um, the chair did ask me to read out a revised version of the proposal, which was read out, and that's where the, um, the, the vote was taken on. 
Um, but certainly, I'm happy if the committee wants to suspend for a short while that I, I get the wording of what Alan was suggesting and see um, if there was any issue in the in the process. But as far as I'm concerned at the minute, um, I, what the committee undertook last week was in line with with process. Uh, could I ask the clerk then, uh, in terms of uh, what we actually voted on at the end of the meeting, uh, you did read out the wording, uh, and uh, certainly uh, I'd asked Orla to confirm her her wording earlier, and it was also published in Matters Arising uh, in the minutes. Um, uh, but what you actually put to the floor, uh, a clerk, uh, and read into the record, was actually, uh, in my opinion, an amendment, because uh, under the definition of an amendment, uh, you add words. There were words added to the proposal that Orla put on the floor. So at that point, uh, it became an amendment. Could, could you confirm that my uh, interpretation that would be correct? Um, th there was an amendment to the proposal that was based on discussions that were ongoing throughout that item of business. But can you confirm we voted on an amendment as opposed to Orla's original proposal? We, we voted on an amended proposal. And, and uh, uh, Alan, if I can just if I can just say there, I think I checked with you during that debate if you were content with the with the proposal as amended by the warden, and the warden the warden reflected what what it was that you wished to add. No, it was. Uh, I told you what my difficulty was. My difficulty, Mr. Chairman, was the second paragraph, uh, and uh, that's what I let, wanted left out. And I, I then was saying that it should then go on to be properly investigated by the Education Authority. Now, if 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 in fact, uh, and you know, I, I seek further advice from this, uh, and, and obviously I can't turn to the Commissioner for Standards to. Take advice, but in terms of uh, the clerk has told me there that at the end we voted for a proposal. I'm suggesting that we voted for an amendment because there was extra words added to the proposal that was on the floor. I think that makes it an amendment. Now, if that is the case, if it is an amendment, and maybe the clerk can confirm this as well for me, uh, that uh, to put an amendment to a meeting. You require the permission of the seconder or the agreement of the seconder to agree to the amended wording. Uh, that uh, permission wasn't sought from the seconder. That was Carl. Uh, she certainly had indicated she was seconding uh, the original uh, proposal, but didn't make any indication after the extra words were added on to it that it was been done with her approval. I've no doubt it was, but uh, the record will, will not show that. Uh, so again, I think that what we voted on at the end was indeed uh, an amendment. And it's quite clear, uh, 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 Mr. Chairman, you refused to take my amendment. Uh, you said, it's uh, your words were, it's uh, suggesting uh, a somewhat different course of action. Uh, and I, I, I can't see that. I'm sorry, I can't see that. Uh, what, um, wh why you would have refused that? Uh, and quite frankly, oh, yeah. the, oh, yeah. the original motion going and been voted on, in which I had the abstain and all conscience, has cost me considerable reputational uh, damage. Uh, and for that reason, uh, I, I sort of feel I have to pursue it. Okay. Um... I've got. I have two indications from members. There, I have an indication, firstly, from Jerry Carroll. Jerry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Chair. I mean, my recollection was the motion by Orlea was pretty clear cut. Um, and you know, if I remember correctly, I mean, this is the third week we're discussing this. It should have been a clear vote that we should have just opposed uh, the um, the article and the the concept of it. In my view, and and Alan spent sort of two weeks, um, you know, a week seeking clarity, which he's entitled to do, a week trying to sort of amend it or change it, which he's entitled to do, and then obviously today trying to, you know, uh, backtrack or uh, whatever. Um, and to me, it was pretty clear cut what the motion says. Um, you know, we, we condemn conversion theory. 
therapy uh, and raise concerns uh, about it being shared. So um, I don't see why we're, we're discussing it again. The committee made its decision and it's used clear cut. Um, and I just think that they were dancing over this issue again where we don't need to be. Yeah. Well, okay, I'm going, I'm going to, sorry, sorry, Alan, 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 no, Alan, I'm going to go to Carol first and then I'll come back to you, Carol. Yeah, yeah so my understanding was that, um, that I mean, Alan um, seemed to be content with or Leah trying to include the sentiment of what he tried to say. Um, the other aspect of it is it seems like, you know, there's been certain amount of criticism levelled at the position that he and others have taken. Um, and it just feels like there's a bit of back paddling going on here. Um, so the the I mean the issue was settled last week of Alan suggesting that any of us, particularly yourself, Chair the Clerk, were deliberately misrepresenting them. I'd like to see evidence of that. Um, but that's not my understanding of what happened last week, or indeed what I seconded as well. Okay. Okay, Alan, go ahead. Well, it's, it's, it'll not be for me to uh, to judge uh, uh, anything about it. I mean, the, the Commissioner of Standards can have a look at it. Uh, I think that the uh, points that I'm putting forward today are are quite clear, quite valid. Uh, and uh, you know, we can talk about backpedalling, uh, but we can also talk about uh, people who particularly want to force through. Uh, a proposal for a particular reason. Uh, I'm not going to uh, level that allegation at anyone, uh, but I certainly uh, feel that uh, the chair uh, did um, refuse to accept a, a, an amendment. Uh, I certainly at no stage that I said I was content with the wording of order. I made it, it, I mean, go back and look at the video, uh, Mr. Chairman, and I hope that's what the Commissioner of, of Standards will do. Yes, Alan, you're, you're perfectly entitled to pursue it however however you feel fit. I have no issue with that at all. I will ask the clerk to review the video in terms of that. I have no issue with that either. I have Pam Cameron, but we do have other significant business on here today, so I do want to move along, and then uh, I'll take Pam Cameron, and then we're going to move the issue on. Thank you, Pam. Thanks, Chair. And I think Alan's making very valid points, and I think it would be appropriate for... Um, the clerk to to look into the issue to make sure that technically all was well with the proposal. I mean, obviously, there's not there's no issue uh, of of backpedalling here that I can see. Of I mean, we made it very clear um, that our opposition to this was in the referral to the two gentlemen who were being named and shamed, and and my uh, suggestion or proposal to contact both those gentlemen and seek clarity from them on the issue was just outrightly ignored by the rest of the committee, uh, which was very disappointing because I think it was grossly unfair on those individuals to uh, to be making judgment on them. And I know that certainly was Alan's point last week as well. And that was the part that he had problem with, as did I. I, did a, I have no um, problem whatsoever with um, objecting very strongly to conversion therapy. And I think too uh, that uh, we, we certainly have another piece of correspondence in in our packs today, which uh, another man is is actually objecting to how this was handled as well. And I would agree with those sentiments as well, because it, it seems that um, a, a, one single view has been taken and there's been no, um, no uh, desire to actually to seek the truth in, in, in any of this, which I think is really quite disappointing. But I have no problem backing um, Alan if, if he wishes to um, seek further information and get clarity on the technicalities of, of how the vote was taken and whether his proposal was an amendment that wasn't taken. I'm happy to back him on that issue. Okay, and um, I am, um, and, and people are fully entitled to have different views on this issue. Um, absolutely no issue with that at all. But the committee has, I believe, derived a fair view after significant discussion over two separate weeks and time being allowed for members to look at, at, the, at the wording. So, um, Alan, quite happy you raised, you raised your concerns. You can raise those with the clerk or, or anyone else you may wish to do so. But for now, I want to move this move the meeting along to the next item. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Okay, so members, moving then to uh, correspondence. I refer members there to papers at tab seven of your pack. 
And I'll draw members' attention to two items out of that correspondence. The first item being 7.9 and 7.10, which are responses from Asthma UK and the British Lung Foundation and Cancer Focus NA to our letter seeking their views on the services provided to those for suffering from mesothelioma. Members will remember this matter was raised by an individual who is dissatisfied with the Minister's recent response to an Assembly question on the matter. So have members any comments they wish to make in relation to that? Chair? Yeah, go ahead, Paula. Thank you, Chair. No, it's good that they were quite prompt in, in responding to those issues, which which was good. I, I suppose um, the information I got back from the Health Minister as well, recently I passed on to that APG on lung health, and I think that we should um, continue to sort of pursue it through that avenue. But just to check if the um, constituent has received copies of those responses. Yes, can I check it, Mr. Clerk, with you? It, it, sorry, Chair, it's in one of the proposals in the in your Chair's brief. Yeah. So, uh, so if yeah, one of the proposals here that we'll be looking at, uh, Paula, is that we would forward. Well, there's a number of proposals emanating from that. Firstly, we would forward the correspondence to the department for comment and request a written briefing from the department on this issue. Are members content with that one? Yeah. Content. Also, that we that we would express concern at the poor survival rates as outlined in the correspondence, which I think are are fairly significant. That we would ask the department if it has any plans to introduce a service model similar to the Scottish model as recommended in that correspondence. And finally, in relation to your point, Paula, that we advise the individual who raised the matter of the committee's actions in this in this matter. So, would members be content with those actions? Okay. Um, Thank you. Sorry, Matt, yeah. um, I, I also Go got ahead. an update from the department um, in a written um, assembly question written, so I could possibly share that then through the clerk to the members because there is a bit of additional information out there. Yeah, I would appreciate that. And Pam, I think you're looking in there as well. Yeah, yes, just to mine. just to say, um, Chair, that I'm, I'm content with those proposals and that would be very useful, Paula. Thank you to, to share that information that you've received from the department as well. So thank you. Yeah. Carl, go ahead. Yeah, Chair, if I could go back to 7.2, the reply to the judicial review into hyponeutremia, I'm not happy to note. Just, just, just a moment, Carl, I want to deal with this issue firstly. I want to clear this issue and then I'll go back to your, your 7.2. Okay. So so uh, that, that's everything in relation to the mesothelioma. Chair, sorry. Yeah, yeah go ahead, Carl. No, I, remiss, I meant to say that um, could we request information whether any best practice links exist? Um, with Scotland and the rest of the UK in relation to rollout of services as well. Could we add that in somewhere within our communication yeah. to the Minister of the Department? Thank Clark, you. Clark, are you content with that? Have you captured? Yes, yes, Chair, I've captured that. Okay, okay. okay so thank you. So, one of then, Carol, can you go back to the issue that you have that you wish to raise? Yeah, so, Chair, it's in correspondence 7.3, the Minister's reply yeah. into the judicial review into hyponatremia. I'm not happy just to note, um, particularly given the response today. So I, I would like to see certainly into it, while it, he said that the department had accepted the recommendations before he even came into the department as minister. But what wasn't clear was, um, you know, in terms of what the department is doing in terms of actioning those issues. Um, and, you know, I think that needs to be um said to be honest so a further a further letter to the department asking them to clarify uh, to explain sure. the issues is that correct Carol? Uh, i have someone yeah. indicating yeah. there yeah sure yeah it doesn't sure they're they're silent on offendings and that's for me it's very important Sure. Can I? Okay. Can I, yeah, Jonathan, go ahead. Uh, look, I I absolutely agree entirely with carl on this point um I think it is our business to ask questions around this, and I think that the minister's response. I, I'm not happy to note either. You know, this this is a serious issue which has went on far too long, uh, and, and we rightly, as a committee, have, have questions to ask around this, in particular. And I know they've said it's a matter because it's an ongoing legal case, but the chief scientific officer, uh, we seen we seen a point where it seemed to be journalists that were in silence from asking questions around this. I, I'm certainly not content with where we are, and I think this committee deserves, and the families involved 
deserve answers and, and they deserve uh, more than what this correspondence is giving to us as a committee. Okay, well, just to say, Jonathan, I'm not aware of that issue that you're referring to in relation to the Chief Medical Officer. However, I, Sorry, I do... I, 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 that, I, Chief Scientific Officer is what I was referring to, not medical. Okay. Um, I, I, I'm also not aware of the detail of that, but, but anyway, I'm, I'm, I appreciate the clarification. So uh, the, the, the proposal is here, members, that rather than note this, that we asked the, the department for further information in relation to the findings. Is that correct, Gerald? First of all, and then I'm going to ask the committee if they're content with that. Yes. Yeah. Are the committee content? Yeah, go ahead, Paula. Um, Chair, there, there, there's three arms to the, the findings um, as such. There's obviously the departmental um, response, but there's also the response of the GMC and also then the police uh, uh, further investigation. I have tried to pursue all three um, avenues on behalf of one of the families, and I have to say the information come back is rather scant. So I'm, I'm wondering, should we maybe have one evidence session just dedicated to this hyponatremia um, report? Because I think that the 96 recommendations, the, the delivery upon those is at varying um, levels of, of delivery. But also there's the issue then of duty of candor and other some of the sort of high profile um, recommendations that I think that we should, as a committee, like um, junior doctors being on paediatric wards, there's a few issues there that we as a committee should be across the detail and be scrutinising. Thanks. Okay, so remember, content further to, to look at maybe arranging within forward work programme a session on, on hyponatremia inquiry? Sure. And sure. And yeah. Let's come back on to because obviously I would totally endorse what, what Paula has said, but you said you weren't aware of the case that I was referring to. It's actually referred in the letter that we had sent originally in relation to this was asking whether or not the department had any financial interest in the ongoing case with between the chief scientific advisor and the GMC in relation to legal proceedings or financial input. Uh, what this letter outlines is that it's not appropriate for them to comment. That's my point. I think it's wholly appropriate. No. Jonathan, no, what, what, I was, what I was referring to was your comment in relation to members of the press being told by the Chief Scientific Advisor. That's the issue that I wasn't no, clear that, on. That, that's not what I said, Chair. Sure. Uh, it, it was raised at a previous committee meeting that whenever questions were probed on this, that journalists were warned to take down those comments that was brought up at a previous committee member meeting. I think that actually, I think Paul is nodding. I think my knowledge is that that's what led to the initial writing to the department on this. So the, the, yeah. the, the, yeah. Department, yeah. the department have told us nothing in this correspondence, nothing at all. And it's, it's only but right that we get answers on it. Yeah. Okay, so members members content to uh, to schedule a further for the work program for their for their uh, session on this issue. Yes, yeah. members could have that clerk. Go ahead, Alan, briefly, please. Just just quickly, if I could just ask Jonathan to clarify. Uh, uh, I'm maybe not as up to speed uh, on this issue as he is, but he said that uh, someone had got in touch with journalists in plural. Uh, is it journalists in plural, or was it a single journalist? I wonder if we have Jonathan no, no problem. I actually wasn't the member to bring this to the committee. Uh, if the member's on, that was, but it was brought to. The, I think it was actually it was maybe Pat Sheehan that brought it to the committee. But it was. I think it was in relation to one journalist that had been asked uh, to remove a comment. Uh, and I, I, I'm, I, all I was asking for at the time, and I think actually whenever Pat raised this, was for the committee to get clarity as to the department's uh, input uh, into the ongoing legal case. Yeah, no, no, no difficulty about it. I just wanted to clarify that it was one journalist as opposed to a whole, uh, a whole media uh, circus, as it were. The, the other the other thing that I want to clarify, I'm not I'm not clear at this point in time whether or not Pat indicated a particular person who had done that. So I want to just make it clear that I'm not. So I, that that is a I, I think I, I do remember the reference to a post a tweet being taken down, but I don't remember that being ascribed to any particular person. Chair. Okay, members, we need we need to yeah uh, very quickly. Who's that, Paula? We need to move along. So Paula, please no, very quickly. It's Pam. Pam, Pam go ahead. Chair. No, it's just to say that it's I the. The issues outlined in in our pack at page one four four, and that's what the minister's answer was to. So just to say, you know, okay. that the, it's there in black and white. Okay, okay, members. Moving on then back to the further items of correspondence. So, um, 
Are members therefore otherwise content with the actions proposed in the correspondence memo, in the main memo? We'll, we'll move on to table of correspondence now. Sure. Members content? Thank you. Sure. Yeah, go ahead, Arlea. Yeah, I, I don't know. I'm sure people um, have had a chance to look at it whenever we received our PEC, but it was just to um, draw the committee members' attention to 7.16. Um, it was a letter that I've sent into yourself just about a private member's bill that um, I'm hoping to bring to the Assembly um, around uh, suicide prevention training and making it a statutory requirement for all uh all uh, public facing uh, frontline workers to receive um, even a limited form of suicide prevention training. So it's just really to, um, to hopefully put it onto people's radar and um, hopefully members will engage with me over the coming weeks and months um, to try and support it. That's that's all. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Arlea. So moving on then, members, to the table pack, which contains sure. a number of items of correspondence. Yes, Pam? Sorry, I was just wanting to come in there on um, 7.3. I know it's it's down to note and it's around the uh, the workforce appeal on that letter. It just it strikes me that you know that was a it was a hugely successful campaign in in asking for help and it talks about 21,000 applications and yet uh, and we do welcome that there were 2,280 appointments made, but. It's still a you know a, only a fraction of the amount of apl applications received. I would just like to hear more on on that subject, and whether or not there weren't more um, healthcare professionals that, that could have been recruited out of, out of those numbers. Because we know that, that there are going to be ongoing issues going going forward into the future, and I think if there's if there are more medical professionals that can help, I, I don't see why we wouldn't be embracing that help. So it just strikes me as a very small number out of the number of applications. They were actually successful. And are you suggesting we write for further information, Pam, just for clarity? I think I think at, um, as a start, that would be a good thing to, to ask for further information and maybe a, a much greater um, breakdown of of uh, in terms of professionals, um, or or maybe we should be asking the department what exactly they were looking for, uh, and. We understand they'll be, they'll give us X amount to who weren't successful, X amount to were rejected and whatnot. But I think we need to know what what are they, what were they actually looking for and what, why were the why was there so few recruited out of, out of that huge number of applications? Okay, uh, so members content with that and just to check that the clerk is clear enough on that. Um, yes, chair. Just to say, we have the chief nursing officer coming up um, in two weeks, and we can certainly cover that issue with. Her as well, but I can certainly follow up on that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, uh, are, are we finished then with the main pack in terms of correspondence members? There's quite a few items in table correspondence, and I'm conscious we uh, we are broadcasting will take us up to half one. So, if we don't get dealing with some of these issues, I think we will have to uh, propose to retable them for next week. But I'll move through and see how we get on. So the table pack contains a number of items of correspondence there as well. First one I want to draw to your attention is item, an item from an individual in relation to mental health and sport. Do you members have any comments in relation to that? Yeah, sure. Yeah, go ahead, Arlia. Um, yeah, so I, I don't know if other committee members received the same email um, from Andrew, but um, it's obviously just flagging up his concerns about um, the... Uh, Orange Lodge that he's grant master of, and and the you know the the sport that would carry out with the mm -hmm. the kids and the adults and stuff, and and it's just again about the impact that um <laughs> on the the mental health of of some of their members. Um, I know obviously it's a really difficult one. Um, you know, given the stuff that the minister was talking about earlier on, and trying to balance even, you know, with retail gyms and and the lockdown, but it might be one maybe just to forward on to. Um, the Department of Health to, to maybe just try and get a wee bit more information or clarity for um, the constituent who's reached out. Okay, thank you. Okay, with that, members? Yeah. Uh, moving then to, uh, there's an item there, is it from an individual in relation to vaccinations for clinically extremely vulnerable children? Um, and members, if you're content, that could be considered at our next briefing on vaccinations, which is in the Foreign Work Program. Thank you. Um, there's a reply there, the Minister, in relation to clamping of HSC staff. 
Do members have any comments in relation to that? Sure. sure. Yes, go ahead, Jerry. Thanks, Chair. Thanks. Yeah. That. Um, sure, can I just ask if we seek some further clarity on that? I appreciate the response, but uh, can we ask the APCOA, um, the Enforcement Service, um, what is the, the detail of the contract uh, between the Belfast Trust? Uh, and also, can we ask for uh, a breakdown of the number of people who were clamped uh, last year? Because I don't think that's in the letter. Um, I want to propose or suggest that if I can. Okay, thank you. And then, members, there's also a, a ministerial reply on the EU medical devices regulations. Are members content to note that pending pending further further uh, I suppose interaction with that particular uh, regulations? Yeah. Okay, members. Moving on then to the forward work program. Can I refer you to sure. draft? Go sure. ahead, go ahead I Jonathan. Don't you, I don't know if you. Or maybe I should have spoke, but it's seven point one eight in relation to the urology inquiry. Yeah, go ahead, Jonathan. Yeah. No, look, ahead. I, I, I agree with the minister and most of my concerns, um, but I, I do feel, and I'm, I suppose because I haven't been on the committee when they've dealt with the public inquiry before. If any other member has, maybe they could could best advise to this. But you know, I I do have a lot of concerns surrounding this because in the minister's initial uh, statement to the house. We the, we the House was given no background as to the grievances that had already been lodged by uh, Mr. O'Brien with the Trust, which which leads me to be very circ circumspect as to why we then led very quickly to a public inquiry when those grievances weren't even heard. Um, so I, I suppose I'm still unclear and uncertain and alarmed at that point. And the other one is that if we do go towards a public inquiry, which the Minister has outlined, that the terms of reference are going to be crucial. Um, does the committee have any input into the discussions around those terms of reference before they're set but with a chairman? Uh, and if so, surely we need to know that those terms of reference include uh, actions that happened leading up to uh, the, the initiation of a public inquiry, predominantly around the need to look into the grievances in which Mr. O'Brien had already lodged. Uh, do other members have clearly you have you have uh, you have vocalised this quite a bit, but I want to take views from other members in relation to this matter, please. So, members, what's your thoughts on this matter? Um, it's been raised several times by Jonathan now, and I I understand he is he is he is uh, focused on it. Um, I have I have said that uh, I believe that there should be due process, and everyone should be entitled to that due process, and that you know there there are significant issues here so i'm i'm a wee bit unclear as to what other members think in relation to this i'd like to take your views chair um chair yes go ahead paula thank you yeah. um, Colin, I, i'm just um, i'm conscious that the patients who will have been um on the um list of patients for for this consultant um that they will obviously be wanting to feed in whether good bad or indifferent but uh, i'm wondering how much the patient client council are going to be involved in actually turn developing the terms of reference for the public inquiry and, and the scope um, of, of the inquiry. I think that's probably going to be very crucial in terms of the people who've been affected um, by, by his, um, his care and treatment. I think that the patient clan council could be contacted as you see what role they're playing in terms of um, shaping the inquiry going forward. Yeah, any, any other views, members? Colm, can I just come in briefly? Yeah, go ahead, Cara. Just to say, I'm in agreement with Jonathan. Um, you know, I have noted concerns as well. Just as well on the aspect of uh, it's public money and the public purse with um, an investigation and inquiry such as this. So I think we should just do everything we can to kind of explore every avenue to ensure. Uh, I just have a lot of questions around how many complaints were made before um, the inquiry was announced and how many have been made after. So I just have a lot of questions. So if there's anyone we can bring forward to the committee, uh, I, I would find it very beneficial. Yeah, any other thoughts, members? Okay, so um, so I'm, I'm just, yeah, go ahead, Alan. Yeah, it's just that, you know, in the past, uh, where the, the standards have, have fallen below what, uh, the public would expect, and um, we, uh, uh, as just pure assembly members, as opposed maybe even to uh, the health committee, uh, we have added our voice uh, and calls for public inquiries because 
the public inquiry does it clears the air for everybody. Uh, it vindicates the innocent and uh, it will find the guilty. Um, and that's 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 the purpose of it. Um, I would just I mean I don't know all the circumstances around this case, but um, there, there must be there must be some reason or rationale. Um, why uh, the department have uh, advised to, to to move forward with the public inquiry, but certainly, uh, I mean, it will be um, it will give everybody the opportunity to uh, to put their to put their case and including uh, any grievances that, that were on the books uh, from this consultant. Well, I have no doubt they will form yeah. part of the public inquiry. So I I, I would sort of I, I would welcome the public inquiry to be honest. Yeah, and, and I do, I do think, I do think it is. Uh, I do think absolutely we can ask for further information on how the terms of reference will be drafted, and I think the terms of reference will be something that we should be looking at. Um, and individual committee members are entitled to to pursue with the department and with anyone else in relation to concerns they have around the case. The difficulty, I suppose, or, or what I, some of the factors that I want to take to, into consideration. Well, first of all, there are. I think we do need to remain conscious. There are nine serious adverse incidents being being looked into here at the present time, and also the committee has to uh, decide. We we have a finite amount of of time in terms of the things that we're looking to to look at. We've already added additional items in today's business, and members do need to be aware. And I'm, I'm open for it if members decide that's the way they wish to go, but these things all have to be fitted in somewhere. So for now, for now, um, would members be content that we seek further information in relation to the terms of reference and, and continue to monitor the situation via that process? Sure. I, I, would say I appreciate appreciate members' comments around that and uh, CARES in particular in relation to further information because that's what we're just asking for as a committee. Uh, I would be content at this stage if the clerk could go away and, and inform the committee as to their input into a terms of reference or indeed even notification before those terms of reference would be set if that's the road that uh, the minister intends to go down. Uh, but uh, and on receiving that information, then I reserve the right to, to again propose that, that we get somebody from the department to give us more information, because I think that's only befitting given uh, the level of public scrutiny around the, this. I understand it's not clinical concerns, it's more administrational. So then you do have the right to ask whether a public inquiry is the right route for this particular case. Okay, sure. Charles, uh, are you indicating for this section, Charles? Yeah, it is absolutely. So I, I've never, I haven't sat on the committee either, and I, I did, I don't understand what well worked previously, but I, I understand if there's a query for additional information, that's grand. But I just feel Jonathan slightly stepping into, um, you know, trying to almost do an inquiry before the any public inquiry starts and while he's right with an absolute right to ask questions with absolute right to see the terms or references um, but anything short of that um, an absence I don't know if it's administrative I don't know what happened and I'm hoping that all comes out and um, so I I just don't want to because we're on the record I don't want to assume that what been said is the case, um, but certainly asking for additional information, I think, is entirely appropriate. Okay, okay, members. So we're content that that's the course of action we'll take, and then we can we can see what that yields and and take it from there. Okay, members, thank you. So our members then otherwise content to note uh, to note the table the, the correspondence to table papers. Thank you, members. Moving on very quickly into forward work programme, can you refer members to the draft forward work programme at tab 8.1 of your pack there? Are members content to note the forward work programme? Yes, members content, thank you. Uh, any other business then, members? And we have dealt with a lot of other bits of business today, but have, have members any other business? No, okay, members, I'm going to move on then. Date, time and place of our next meeting. Our next meeting will be on Thursday, 18th of February at 9.30 a.m. via video link. Program signed. Thank you, members. Okay. This is the Northern Ireland.